we start the session at 210. Right, right. So that means uh, we have 20 minutes. Yeah, around 17 minutes, yes. Yes, sir. Shall we?
afternoon those who have joined uh, soon we are going to start the program uh, we have scheduled the inaugural function at 2:10 uh, in between if you require any support or uh, related to technical help or about the program we'll be happy to respond to you so participant feel free to interact with us and uh, in case if you could have any query related to the program related to how to join technical support etc feel free to interact okay one more announcement i wish to make uh, i'm sure all of you have gone through the schedule of inaugural session program so fourth item is the uh, photograph okay so group photograph you are going to capture at that time we are going to request all of you to switch on your camera okay in case if you would like to test it right now feel free to do that so at that time i'm going to request you to switch on your camera and also adjust your distance from uh, from the camera so that a uh, group photograph can be captured okay yeah you are on mute sir uh, namaskar uh, professor hey, good morning hello hello so for us it is afternoon uh, we are almost to 2:03 afternoon okay so well, good afternoon to you but it's early, early morning time. for me <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> my picture good yeah all, all good sir thank you very much for joining on time and professor rajiv tripathi sir has also joined so soon we are going to start the session and uh, we are waiting for our institute director to join he is likely to join at 2:10 that's fine so I'll, I'll, I'll switch off for now i'll see you later yeah sure sure you, you may take your time yeah yeah So I hope I'm audible to you. Please test your mic uh, so that uh, immediately plus once yes, the camera joins, we'll be we should be able to start the program. Sure, sir. Am I audible, sir? You are audible, and you are also requested to share the screen. Uh, no, as I told you to share the inaugural yeah. uh, banner. So that can be shared till the time uh, Professor Verma joins. So participants again, once again, I, I must mention, I, I can see that many of you have joined just now. So we are going to start at 2.10 and uh, inaugural session uh, program schedule is already available with you. All of you are having access to the program schedule. In that we have mentioned that we are going to have a group photograph that is going to be virtual group photograph. At that time, I'm going to request you to switch on your camera. So please do at the earliest possible time. So as you are requested so earliest possible so that we will save some time okay 
Thank you very much. So may you also please keep an eye on the list of participants. So inform me once Professor Verma joins. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, Professor Verma, sir, hope uh, you have joined and I'm audible to you. Yes, yes, you are audible to me. Fair enough, sir. Yeah, so uh, another few seconds we'll wait and then we'll start exactly at 2.10. Okay, okay, no issue. Yeah, yeah sure, sir. Now, sir, thank party. you for, thank you, sir. Thanks for joining. No issue, this is our work. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now may I request, uh, with your permission, uh, uh, Professor Verma, sir, uh, I wish to request, uh, yeah, I wish to request Soumya to please uh, start the session. Over to Soumya. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Am I audible, sir? You are. Okay. Uh, a very warm good afternoon to all the guests and dignitaries uh, and delegates to this five days Gyan program. I'm privileged to welcome all of you on behalf of Motilal Nehru National Institute of Technology, Allahabad, who has assembled all of us for this five days Gyan program on advances in nanotechnology and its application in future electronics. Before starting the inaugural session of this program, I would like to welcome all the honorable guests to the dais. Professor R.S. Verma, di uh, R.S. Verma, sir, director, MNNIT, and chief guest of this inaugural session of five days Gyan program. Professor David Harvey, sir, foreign faculty, mm -hmm. Liverpool, John Morris University, UK, and guest of honor of this inaugural session. Professor Rajiv Tripathi, sir, program coordinator to this program. 
professor gp sahu sir program co coordinator to this gyan program and local coordinator of gyan now i request professor gp sahu sir to welcome the guests and the participants to, and provide insights about the program over to you sir yeah th thank you very much samya thank you for starting initiating the program i'm going to share a set of slides so that easily i can tell you tell the audience present here about the program so one of you please confirm samya please confirm whether my slides are visible yes sir it is visible yeah okay so <coughs> Once again, good afternoon, all the uh, all present here, respected uh, Professor Aris Verma, sir, chief guest of the session and director of MNIT, uh, Professor David Harvey, foreign faculty. Uh, he is from Liverpool John Muir University, UK. Uh, Professor Rajiv Tripathi, sir, he is the program coordinator. My other colleagues present here i can see in the list uh, professor geetika is participating uh, professor uh, dr yogen prajapati dr arun prakash my other colleagues uh, are also present in this uh, program all the participants good afternoon to all of you i'm i'm extremely thankful to all the participants who have joined and thankful to professor aris verma for giving his for his consent to participate in this program and grace the occasion inaugural function of the program the program is a global initiative on academic network and under this uh, banner we are organizing advances in nanotechnology and its application in future future electronics foreign faculty is professor arvid uh, who is uh, supporting our institute for quite long time he is associated with the electronics engineering department and also associated with one of the uh, program that we had in the uk rec project so from that point uh, all of us many of us are familiar with uh, him so i'll i'll briefly tell about the program that global initiative of academic network this is started in the year 2016 and we as an institute associated with this program from the very beginning the program's objective is to tapping the talent pool of scientists and entrepreneurs internationally it is not restricted to only scientists or faculty colleagues from the uh, outside the country but also we are requesting entrepreneurs to come and then deliver lectures and collaborate with uh, the indian faculty indian research organization further to augment the country's existing academic resources it is not only <coughs> that lecture delivery and then some knowledge dissemination dissemination takes place but also we are augmenting the entire support of you know by taking support of foreign faculty we are augmenting our laboratories we are also augmenting our knowledge set or generating <coughs> knowledge pool for people who are educated in the this area and therefore this way this program become very very important so that way I'll, i must mention that ministry of education government of india this is gyan is one of the flagship program and under this program ministry has uh, approved 2101 number of courses out of which 1612 number of courses has already been completed 40 48 of number of programs are lined up so including the programs that we are starting today so this way i'm i'm giving you the entire country's perspective uh this is the gyan website uh, participant you must have gone through it and here the this is a dynamic data automatically it gets updated so that's the number reflected here on the gyan website the objective of the gyan website is of course i have mentioned about the, the knowledge dissemination or in the area of teaching skills developing the knowledge and teaching skills in the cutting edge area or cutting edge technology so that's the objective primary objective and then other objectives are uh, reputed international faculty we invite and then collaborate it is not that inviting and then getting a program done but beyond this program we keep interacting with the foreign faculty establish the relationship it is not that in faculty and coordinator gets network 
networking done, but it is institute to institute networking and then further it is country to con country network networking takes place. So avenue for possible collaboration in future also, we, we try to have more revenue, generate more revenue for the future collaborative research work. International students also, we try to explore in case if we can invite international students in our academic institution, that is another uh, uh, objective of this GYAN initiative. Not only foreign uh, students, but also students from India can go abroad and then take uh, some courses over there. So student exchange program may also be explored. So it is subject niche area that current and emerging area we always focus on and then try to develop our strength and our uh, faculty members with those uh, current emerging area. So that's the primary set of objective. These are the areas in which primary areas, including all the disciplines of engineering, management, and social sciences are included here, starting with, you know, <clears throat> proposal can be submitted, that's written over here, but uh, engineering, architecture, design, planning, chemical, earth sciences, electronics, electrical, then humanities and liberal sciences, law, life sciences, almost all the areas are mentioned here. So uh, we are submitting proposals in this area and then getting approved uh, for running the courses, faculty development program, and then especially for the students also. These are the set of uh, uh, the programs that we have organized in our institute that MNIT Allahabad has so far organized 32 number of programs. List goes like this. We started exactly today. We are completing six years. So 7th March 2016, we started the first program and then till date we have organized organized 32 number of programs and this is the 33rd number of pro uh, number of program we are organizing starting today. Uh, the programs that we have organized details are available on the our institute website. So you may see that mnnit.ac.in and then in case if you are interested in any of the previous program you may visit our institute website and then list of programs already organized is there and then this list is also having the video lectures of previous all programs. Okay, So this way it will appear on your screen once you log into our institute website at mnnit.ac.in. That link will give, take you to the video content available. Briefly, I'll tell you since man, man, many of you are participating from distant places, different organization, or probably first program in, the, uh, in our institute, MNNIT, so brief detail about our institute. We are an old institute established in the year 1961 and we are presently we are celebrating our Diamond Jubilee. So institute has granted uh, status of institution of national importance by special act of parliament and we are offering nine BTEC program, 19 MTEC program, MBA, MCA, MSc and PhD program in almost all the disciplines of the engineering and social sciences. These are the various academic departments we have in our institution, 14 academic departments starting with applied mechanics, biotechnology, chemical engineering, civil engineering, computer science, electrical engineering, electronics, mechan mechanical, chemistry, mathematics, physics, management, humanities, and GIS. So few pictures of our institute, uh, the academic building, the hostels, the library, this is the program schedule. Uh, hope Professor Rajiv Tripathi Sarvas will also talk about this uh, program detail. But these are the topic. All the participant, you have a copy of this schedule, and most of the content will be delivered by foreign faculty, Professor Dave Har David Harvey, and few portion of it will be delivered by Professor Rajiv Tripathi and other faculty colleagues in the department, Electronics Engineering Department. About the participants, so far we have received 53 number of registered participants. And out of this participant, the composition is like faculty 15, industry professionals 2 have joined and the students 36. This is the program. Government is spending a lot of money for the benefit of students. You know, uh, many of the programs, they focus on only faculty refresher program or faculty development program, but here we get <coughs> opportunity to train our students as well with the foreign faculty. This is, this is a list of faculty who are going to engage classes. As I mentioned, most of the classes are 
14 lectures will be delivered by Professor David Harvey, and he is a professor with Liverpool John Moore University, UK, specialized in the area of nanotechnology electronics. Professor Rajiv Tripathi sir is going to deliver few lectures, and he is a senior most professor in our institute, uh, MNNIT, Allahabad. Uh, other faculty colleagues from the electronics engineering department are also also going to deliver few lectures. Uh, Dr. <coughs> Prajapati is going, Yogendra Prajapati is going to be uh, delivering one lecture, and Dr. Sreta Tripathi will also deliver a lecture. So, <coughs> talking about the pedagogy, how are we going to learn during this uh, five days time? So on, all the classes are going to be online with the help of this Microsoft Teams, the same platform through which we we are all connected. And also we are going to make use of learning manage, digital learning management system that is Google Classroom on which we are going to share the slides, teaching material, and also we'll upload the assignment in between the, on day three, you're going to get an assignment which needs to be uploaded on day four. So response to the assignment to be uploaded on Google Classroom. Now, I'm, I'm sure all of you are a member of Google Classroom, which has been created for the participants. And then at the end of the program, we are going to organize a quiz. So evaluation is going to be there. And this is very, very important. And this uniqueness of the program that we get a, not only a participation sub certificate we are going to give you, but we are also going to give you a mark sheet. OK, so mark sheet will look like this. Uh, this is the sample copy of mark sheet. So great sheet. Another important thing about this grade set is that the credit transfer is possible. UGC has already permitted, even prior to this uh, new education policy, we were pr permitted to transfer uh, credits, those who have grades or credits with the, this global in initiative of academic network can be transferred as and when needed to the any of the academic programs. So that guideline we have already, we have from UGC and Ministry of Education. Uh, the grades are also going, we are going to assign grades based on the marks you are, you, participant you are going to obtain. So based on the marks, you can see this, uh, how, how the grades will be assigned. This is a simple copy of the certificate you can expect from us based on three things. Okay, so you are securing your attendance percentage has to be there. Your 80% of the time you should be present in the class. Then marks to be obtained, certain marks restriction is also there. It should not happen that you are failed in the subject and then still uh, eligible to get the certificate. And then class performance of submitting the assignment. So these things are important. And we are supported by a team of student. All the participant, you have this uh, the students number as well. They are available all the time on phone, on WhatsApp, and on Teams as well to support you in terms of technical support needed or in terms of any uh, some some knowledge you require or some discussion you would like to have related to the course. So feel free to ask us. Ask any of the uh these student members including me and uh, professor Rajiv Tripathi. uh sir. so they are Soumya gupta mr vikas and manish kumar rajit this program we are going to make available already made available on youtube channel so this is the link for the youtube channel uh one way communication of course so later on we are going to add it and then upload on the uh, digital library, you know, national digital NDL, national digital library. So that's uh, another mandate or important thing about the program that all the content which are developed here, that video lecture and then uh, the TLM, that teaching learning material, are uploaded on the <coughs> national digital library NDL, NDL and also on the Gyan portal. So that way, it is very very important program. All of you are. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful to you that you have taken this initiative and joined the program. The network is to be established here. So program name is also <coughs> Global Initiative on Network. So network means like-minded people or like in uh, all of you, those who are joined have joined this program are working in the area of possibly nanotechnology or electronics. 
and you have a common interest area, common research area. So therefore, networking at multiple level, peer-to-peer -peer networking is important. Networking with the, you know, your networking with the institute faculty member is important. Your networking with the foreign faculty is important. And then your institute networking with our institute and foreign uh, faculties institution is also equally important. So that way we are going to planning to build this relationship and then taking it to country to country networking for the research purposes for augmenting our laboratory for augmenting the knowledge set etc so that's the objective here thank you very much for patient hearing now i, I pass in pass into Soumya. over to Soumya, please thank you so much sir thank you for providing the brief insights about the program now i humbly invite professor rajiv tripathi sir co uh, coordinator of the design program to provide further insights about the program. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Soumya. Uh, Honorable Director, Sir R.S. Varma, sir. Foreign faculty from Liverpool, John Moose University, Professor Arve, my colleague, Professor J. Sahu, other distinguished faculty colleagues from uh, Electronics and Communication Engineering Department, and from other departments of the institute, my dear participants. Well, uh, Professor Sahu has already explained about the Gyan and uh, uh, all the activities related with the Gyan and how the course will be administered. And uh, since I congratulate Professor Sahu as a local GAN coordinator also for assisting all of us faculty members in the institute for preparing the proposal for taking the initiative etc and that's why our institute is at this level in terms of conducting GAN program <coughs> well this is a five days program which is uh, uh, on nano advances in nanotechnology and its application in future electronics. Uh, as we all know that uh, nanotechnology is a relatively new thing which has come up and uh, it's a great and it has got great applications in all the fields, not only in the area of electronics, but also in the area of medical sciences. Uh, over the period of last two decades, the tremendous advancement has taken place in the in almost all the areas, but specifically in the areas of communication and medical sciences, and that too particularly in the area of surgery. Now. This success is uh, one of the major, I'll not say that major thing, but one of the major attribute on advancements in not only in these two areas, but in almost all the areas is in terms of developing different kinds of materials and uh, their combination for different applications. And then <clears throat> creating circuit, then uh, putting it to the applications. So uh, I need to say that today we cannot talk in isolation. We have to have the integration of different kinds of technologies which have matured and the advancements in the material science. Because in electronic circuits also, uh, we started with uh, tubes, then discrete components, then circuits, then uh, a very large scale circuits, and uh, micron technology. And now we are talking about nanotechnology. Uh, as you go on, So, uh, at nanotechnology level, the electronic circuit design and uh, at transistor level, at inverter level, 
there are different kinds of challenges and uh, those challenges are primarily because we have narrowed it down to nano level where the quantum effect and all other uh, things come into picture but at the same time reducing the power increasing the speed providing a good connectivity non blocking connectivity from one stage to another stage and uh, further miniaturizing the circuit all those things are possible now using the nanotechnology these five day this five days program it is primarily intended to create an interest in the subject because in five days it's not possible to cover all the aspects of uh, nanotechnology in electronics application so if the interest is created half work is done after that you have the network you have the whatsapp group you have the material you can proceed further in this area as far as this course is concerned as has been said by professor sahu that major portion will be covered by professor harve as per the <clears throat> requirement of the gyan course he will be talking about uh, different uh, circuits transistor level in the nanotechnology then he will be talking about uh, test and testability in built in the circuits and uh, then what i will be talking about is network on chip network on chip is primarily talking about the different circuits at different uh, segments and then putting it on the same silicon one of the challenges will be for providing the interconnection between those stages uh, different stages and uh, that i shall be talking about then uh, advances in nanotechnology will be taken care of by professor uh, yogen prajapati and uh, then the fabrication transistor etc that all will be taken care of by dr shweta tripathi we have also planned a demo uh, session because uh, we are in virtual mode uh, we cannot interact on the software in the lab but yes two two sessions probably they have been planned as a demo session on the software which is dealing with the narrow technology circuit simulation so with all these and you have the detailed program with you and uh, again i congratulate all the participants that you have spared time you have uh, uh, thought of taking part in this program and uh, i am sincerely thankful to my honorable director professor verma sir for sparing time and uh, gracing this inaugural session hope that you all will enjoy the coming 5 days and uh, um, professor sahu has already informed about the team i am also available any time anything on the whatsapp and uh, we can start we can further increase our network professional network academic network have collaborative activities earlier also we had a collaboration at different levels with professor dev harve in terms of completing joint projects in terms of having joint masters thesis and uh, hope that with this platform we will continue further thank you thank you all for joining thank you thank you so much sir i hope participants would have seriously benefited from the talk on the nanotechnology and future of electronics whereas they would have also received the schedule and the uh, brief content of the program thank you so much sir uh, to further proceed with the program now i would like to request professor david harvey sir foreign faculty liverpool 
of this program liverpool john morris university uk and guest of honor of this inaugural session to say few words among us yes uh, good afternoon am i clear yes sir you yes right yeah yes i must do so I'd like to uh, w welcome, uh, first of all, the new director, the Honourable Professor Verma, who I haven't had the pleasure to meet yet. So nice to see you online. My old friend, Professor Rajiv Tripathi, former director, now back to research. Uh, esteemed Gyan coordinator, Professor Sahu. Um, Ms. Somya Gupta and all her support team for facilitating, because you know, we need your support and all the delegates. So just to introduce it shortly, because you'll be hearing a lot more from me over the next uh, week or so. Thank you for inviting me to give this Gian course. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, even if it's virtual. I'd much rather be at your institutes, but maybe in the future. And um, just a bit more about me. I'm a, the first professor in electronic engineering at my university in Liverpool, which is Liverpool John Moores University. Um, I'm now the oldest living faculty professor from the neck up. What I do in this court, I aim to review the field and provide some useful pointers over the first day for design tests and applications. And going into the further days, I introduce things like asynchronous design which isn't studied in too many universities, which is quite important for the future. If you haven't studied it before, asynchronous design is design without clocks. So we can reduce the delay in the system. Regarding my association with uh, the Institute, it goes back over 25 years, as uh, has been said. I first visited uh, in 1995 to 1998 as part of a UK-India uh, REC Design Centre programme, where we helped to set up a design centre. And only two were set up in India, one in Allahabad, which I'd say was the best one, and another one in Jaipur. And from our association, uh, many faculty from your institute visited me in Liverpool and spent extended periods looking at how we teach things like VLSI design and interacting with local industry. Because at the time I was running uh, an industrial unit worth about 10 million pounds over five years, working with about 300 companies. So good experience had by faculty and also good research was done and friendships were made. And I urge all the participants, as has been said, to use this as a chance to build your own networks. Because it's very useful you know, to have a friend you can call and colleagues you can discuss uh, things with. After the UKREC project, we applied to the Government of India and got a UK India Science and Technology Research Fellowship for another two years. And that was with Professor Tripathi and Professor Sunny Tiwari, I think is now retired. And that was to do with uh, application of VLSI for switching fabrics, which at the time you had some world leading research going on at the Institute. And that was from 1997 to 99. Then we struggled to get funding for quite a long time. And then I last visited your institute on a different program in 2017. So I hope to come again soon. And if other opportunities are available, you know, I'm available. So in, in a nutshell, I want to welcome you all here. And I hope you take away some useful information and know-how from my own experience from this course, um, find it fun as well as beneficial. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. It was pleasure listening to you as well as uh, the uh, past we have collaborated and future also we are looking for the same. So thank you so much, sir. Now I feel honored to invite, it was a pleasure, uh, I feel honored to invite uh, Professor R. S. Verma, sir, Director, MNIT, uh, to say a few words, as well as uh, the Chief Guest of the program, to say a few words among us. Thank you very much. Namaste and Namaskar to all of you. And I think good morning to Paul. David, right? There. 
Yes. And uh, I'm very delighted that uh, this program has been organized by MNIT. And I welcome all the participants uh, and delegates for this meeting. First of all, I would like to congratulate Mr. Dr. Professor Tripathi and Dr. Sahu to organizing such a, a wonderful program on, under the GAN bannership. So this course which advanced in nanotechnology and application in future electronics is really needed for the hour. And I'm sure that all the students will benefit from them. And all the delegates participating from all around India uh, who have joined in this online program, I welcome you at the online virtual program, actually, I would say that. I wish you all would be there in, uh, should be there in uh, our campus. Our campus is very vibrant, uh, has been done very nicely uh, under the uh, Professor Tripathi. I think he has done a wonderful job uh, for maintaining and also improving the infrastructure. I really, really congratulate him for them. And this course basically, uh, although I'm not an electronic person, but I can understand when I went to the US for the first time in 1980, I have to wait two hours to the uh, post office for making a phone call. <laughs> so you know that now, you don't have to go anywhere from your mobile. You can use this technology and call anybody in the world. And now we are looking each other across, you know, thousands of kilometers using this technology. So it's a, it's a wonderful that uh, for the last 40 years we have come across such a such innovations and which makes the the distance basically very close to each other by using this technology. And also, basically, uh, if I remember correctly. And the aeroplanes fly by wire is also use this kind of chips uh, in aeros aerospace and flying uh, company also. So that the, you don't need any, just by pushing a button or uh, moving your hand, you can really control the, uh, the aeroplane these days in such a wonderful technology that has been developed. So what we have seen a, a constant evolution in terms of electronics and the gadgets from 1960 onwards that really, really make a, make a miniature miniaturization of the old things. When I joined my PhD in 1978, we used to learn a program COBOL and used to be a huge network where you have to have a cards where you punch it to understand what is going on in those days. Now we don't require, everything is available in a small microchips, similar kind of things where it has a you know, millions of billions of data embedded in that one information basically and how they have developed using this technology is really made wonders in our lives. It can also help in health system, health science system uh, in terms of the managing the people in terms of, you know, uh, developing a new gadgets which can communicate each other. Uh, communication technology basically I would say that high speed interconnectivity basically and global broadcast in TV also this technology has played a very tremendous role basically and of course the mobile technology is really taken a great leaps uh, in last 20 years uh, in in 2000 we had uh, you know 13 digits numbers uh, and we used to be a pocket there was a ringer was there and it will beep and then you have to reply on those issues and dial the number and then use it now that technology is gone it's obsolete nobody use any more vcr Nobody use any cassette anymore. Everything's available on the pen drive these days. And also nowadays in a cloud mechanism. You can download anything from the cloud these days just by pressing one, one button at your fingertip. So see the chip technology and this nanotechnology has given a tremendous role in developing those kind of uh, systems. I'm, I'm from health background and I use nanotechnology in different terms, delivery of the drugs, sustained delivery, where you know you don't have to take a medicine every three times a day. You can take a drug for one day and it will 24 hours, 40 hours, it will deliver the drug using those nanotechnology. So in a different area, the nanotechnology has played a very important role these days. I would say that, <laughs> that Param computers, which used to be a huge, you require a huge facility for that, is no more required. I still desktop, you can do anything. Nowadays, laptop has come, replacing the desktop. Maybe someday mobile will be more miniature 
which I don't know how many miniature you will develop it in the future. So maybe the voice recording, voice data, you speak everything, it will come to your noise, uh, to ear. One day it is going to be there. So it's a wonderful uh, technology. And I'm hope uh, Professor David Harvey will entertain you and also give you insight of the nanotechnologies in the communication area and electronics basically next five days. And of course, our own faculty, Professor Trivati, Professor Sahu and other people I will help in doing those things. And I welcome Professor Harvey for this wonderful program, which you are doing it. And I hope that by, uh, with help, with, we'll call you here if something goes, everything goes right. You know, so you can visit for a long time India. India, the Prayag has changed. The, the Lahabad is new name is Prayagraj. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here. I mean, I'm a, I, I moved after 40 years here, 1978 onwards, I came here. So almost 35 years I am here, but I see a lot of changes here. Uh, people are much prosperous, things are much better, communication is much good. So I think all thing goes to the, uh, the, the inno innovation and invention. And technology has taken a shape and I hope that in five days the students and all the delegate will learn and will continue this kind of process with the help of our faculty in the future also and we'll have some more GAN program uh, in a different area also uh, and then we'll we'll take it and thank you very much for giving me opportunity. I wish all the success for this program and if anything they require from the administrative side please let me know. I'll try to help you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, I hope everybody get insights regarding the practical uh, applications of nanotechnology in our day-to-day -day life. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, now I request all the participants uh, to assemble, uh, switch on their uh, camera for a group photograph we can have. So. Yeah, thank you very much, Samya. Now, uh, participant, you are requested to switch on your camera. I'm sharing my screen so that you can see how I'm going to capture the photograph, group photograph in a virtual mode. Uh, hope my screen is visible to all of you now. And uh, I'm putting all of you virtually in a classroom. So soon you're going to see how it appears. Yeah. So now you are requested to adjust your size in the on the chair by adjusting distance from your camera. OK, so looking good. Yeah, Where is my? From, oh, I can see that. Okay. Yeah, you, you are there, sir. Yeah, that control we do not have where we uh, you are put. OK, so, no, no issue. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. So a <clears throat> few more uh, participants. I'm waiting you to as in when you you'll switch on your camera, you'll be fixed in one of the chair. Okay. So participant, please switch on your camera and I'll, I'll keep capturing. Soumya, you are also requested to keep capturing the photographs, screenshots. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Yeah, I need to capture and then paste it somewhere so that uh, you know, it is available for the future. Okay. So sir, if your screen is visible. Yeah. Yeah, now it is visible. Yeah. I can see Professor Kitika Madam as well. Yeah, so she, she is occupying the first first bench. That's great. Yeah, thank you very, very much, Madam. I'll I'll put it somewhere, copy it somewhere. One more I picture. Dave. I, I, so. Yeah, Dave, Dave is. Uh, Dave. Uh, I, in the first photo, photograph, uh, Professor Dave was there. Yeah, he. Okay. Yeah, you're there. Yeah, here. I can see you. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Good, good. Yeah. So one more picture, a uh, little some smile also I'm, I'm expecting. Thank you very much. I'm going to capture one, two, three. Thank you very much. We are done with the virtual photograph capturing. And uh, over to Soumya again. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And thank you all the participants for uh, uh, coordinating with us regarding the group photograph. Now I request uh, Professor G.P. Sahu sir to finally give the vote of thanks uh, for winding up this program. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Okay, so I, I just missed it that it is on me only. Thank you very much, Samya, uh, for coordinating and uh, 
I'm thankful to our honorable director, sir, for sparing time and then providing us all the support. Uh, in his speech also, he acknowledged that we are going to get continuously, we are going to get uh, his support in, the, in future programs as well. So thank you very much, uh, sir, for sparing time honoring this uh, program. I'm thankful to Professor Harvey. Uh, he's the key person uh, here. Uh, without his support, uh, not even getting this proposal. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and then he supports in preparing the proposal as well. Uh, so that's a great thing, uh, great support we have received you uh, from you, Professor Harvey, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, we are thankful to Ministry of Education and Government of India for sponsoring this program. This is a huge amount of money they are uh, providing uh, in terms of number of programs that you have seen 2,104 number of programs they have already sponsored. So that's a great amount, big amount of money we are receiving uh, as a whole. I'm, I'm talking about all academic institutions of the, uh, India. Uh, big thanks to the sponsors. Uh, IIT Kharagpur is the nodal agency who is coordinating on behalf of Ministry of Education for the, all the Gyan programs. Thanks to IIT Kharagpur and all the nodal officers, nodal coordinators present there. I'm, I'm thankful to the Institute uh, for providing the support, all the infrastructure, network, and then facilities. Participants, you, you are the key person here that without your interest in the program we could not we could not have started this thank you very much for taking interest and joining this program registering for this program i'm sure that our faculty colleagues are going to deliver lecture of state of art lecture for uh, you and then I'm, I'm sure that all of you are going to be a satisfied learner uh, uh, from this program this program is going to continue for another two months, three months, as much as you want, that five days we are not going to end. This WhatsApp uh, group is going to continue or we are also going to be there on, uh, in touch. So anytime you can interact with us. Uh, my support team members, uh, Soumya uh, Gupta, you can see here, she has been coordinating. Thankful, I'm thankful to Soumya, I'm thankful to Vikas backend support team, Amrindra and Vikas uh, and Manish are doing. So there is a big team of people at the back office as well for the live streaming of the program, recording, editing, etc. Managing the file, downloading the file. So this way, with this, we are coming to the end of the program. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor Burma sir, for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Harvey sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar. So, we, Swami, would you like to announce three o'clock reassemble? Yes, yes sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for a uh, word uh, of thanks. And uh, now I would like to thank all the participants as well as the uh, dignitaries for uh, this program. Uh, again, we would be meeting at 3, uh, uh, 3 p.m. And uh, the topic of the program would be modern digital electronic design techniques, uh, synchronous design and applications. Uh, so we would be starting again at 3. So I request all the participants to kindly join on time. No, be, be here only. So we have hardly five minutes more. Three, yeah. uh, three minutes, just five minutes more. Yeah, just five minutes. So we'll, yeah. all of you are requested to stay back. We'll start the session at 3 and uh, 3 p.m. Indian Standard Time, okay? For UK, it is going to be, I think, uh, 9.30, okay? So, we <clears throat> please wait for five minutes and we'll start the session. Professor Harvey, is it uh, okay? He has also possibly taken break of uh, for five minutes. So, <clears throat> we'll start at 3 p.m. Indian Time. No, you can take a break for me. I'll come back. To, I'll come back a bit early to try and share the screen. Sorry. Whether to share the screen, it's easy to just click the button, or does someone yeah, need to give me permission? If you would like to test uh, the screen sharing, etc., you can do it right now, sir. Let's do it now, yeah, just to see. If I yeah. Share. Yeah. Let me see. Do we have some audio content as well to share? No, no, it's just, just voice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 You can see it. So yeah, that's good. It's working fine. Uh, you can make it full screen if you'd like to. Yeah. 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 Ye
I can see my our in global initiative of Cardmic Network is visible yeah. here. Are they yeah. gone now? Is yeah. Okay. I'll have a cup of tea and I'll be back in five minutes. Yeah, sure. Take your time. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So participants, please just stay back for another four or five minute time. You need to wait and then we'll start the session start at three Indian time.
Great to Hello. see you, sir. Yeah. Are we, are we ready to go? <laughs> yeah. Share ready. the screen. Yeah. Samia, do you, do you want to say something or state where we can request? Yeah. I think no, Samia would like. Uh, yeah, yeah, Samia, everything. please announce the topic and welcome him. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we would be having uh, the, this session with uh, David Harvey, sir. David Harvey, sir, uh, received the BSc honors and PhD degree in electrical and electronic engineering for from the Liverpool Polytechnic, Liverpool, UK, in uh, 1979 and uh, 1984, respectively. His area uh, research has been concerned with design and test of electronic instrumentation and optical metallurgy systems. His recent focus has been on the non-disruptive evolution of manufactured automotive. Uh, 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 electronics using noble techniques uh, and uh, currently he would be handling the session uh, on uh, modern di uh, digital electronic design techniques synchronous designs and uh, and its applications uh, so over to you sir and uh, we can start with the session thank you very much I'll, I'll try to share the screen can you let me know if you can see it sure sir, sure, sir. Is that okay? It is visible, so you good to go, sir. And you, you can hear me okay now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay, so let, let's get. So, what I propose to do for this topic is spend about one hour out of the schedule and have a short break before we go on to the second topic, which is testing. Uh, so, all I can see is my slides, so I assume people are here. If if, you, if anything is wrong, please let me know. <laughs> sure, sir. Sure, sir. Because I, I can just see the slides. Interacting with you, sir. Okay. If there's any problem, let me know. Because I can't see any chat. I can just see the slide at the moment. Okay. So, welcome again to this uh, Guillaume course. Uh, the first session is really to look at the background of. Uh, where we're at with modern digital electronic design and then just to revise some important techniques which we still need to be aware of when we're doing clock design which leads into how we do the testing uh, this afternoon or later this afternoon and then tomorrow we go more on to asynchronous design which is a new type of design so today's mainly clock design but to start with i want to just review uh, how technology has developed so your esteemed director was saying that uh, in the past people didn't have mobile phones they were had pages so a pager was something you'd wear on your person you know, on your trousers or on lapel when it beeped you had to go to a phone to call your office so this is uh, very useful for people like service engineers who are out in the field and they can't be contacted because your know, mobile phones didn't exist when the first mobile phone was coming in, something like this Motorola one. And in the UK, we used to call it a house brick. So it's the same size as the bricks you build houses out of in the UK. And very heavy, uh, pretty unreliable, really, and very expensive. So the only people that had them were executives, like an executive toy, and maybe some super salesman who wanted to be available to call up customers. And side by side, you can see how the transistor size at that time, 1983, the junction size was about one micron. So what we're trying to show with technology development is how uh, mobile phones have advanced, but also they've been able to advance due to the advance in the transistors. So Nokia, I've actually still got a Nokia phone. Uh, it's not with me now, but this Nokia is a Finnish company. Motorola is mainly American and they make chips as well. Uh, became very famous, probably the number one phone company in the world for a while. Made very smart, uh, not smart, very small, uh, reliable phones. Um, this is a typical one here. As you can see, it's just used for calls. I'm not sure if you can maybe send text in those days on that one, but we see the transistor size has gone down by a factor of four. 
from 83 to 97, and the transistor's gone from a house brick to something you could easily slip inside a pocket. And I'd say it's far more convenient than the big smartphones we've got today. So I've still got this sort of phone. And I've actually still got a Nokia, but a later version than this, and it still works. Sorry, but so the second slide is uh, developments to 2004. You see again, the chip size has gone down again to 0.13 micron or 130 nanometers with the new uh, transistor designs. Um, this Motorola Razr was a very popular phone. It's a flip phone, so the lid actually closed onto the keyboard. And again, it would fit in a handbag or a pocket very easily. And a lot of people tried to copy it. And Motorola at the time was one of the leading phone manufacturers. And the problem with this type of phone is if you keep opening and closing the hinge, a bit like a laptop, but on a phone probably on a more regular basis, eventually the connectors between the screen and the keyboard will tend to break due to mechanical stresses and strains. So nice, neat phone, very popular, but with some design faults maybe. But again, phones advance so quickly. How long do you want to keep a phone? And again, the transistor revolution went on from 0.13 micrometers to 10 nanometers by 2017. And the popular phone was the Samsung Galaxy S8, along with a lot of Apple phones in these days. And very powerful now. You see, you've got a full screen on the phone, uh, which also means you can break very easily. But people like this. And since then, phones have got even more powerful. Now, interesting point in going from to 2017 is transistors used to be just on one level. Now the gate is going in the third direction. So transistors, to get more transistors on a single chip, we're going more three-dimensional, which this FinFET is an invention around that time, which was actually realized in phones such as this one. So one of my research topics I'll touch on uh, on Friday, later in the week, is about solder materials <coughs> and how you connect ICs and ICs onto PCBs together. And recently I've been looking at nanomaterials which we put into solder to try and make it uh, more, more reliable. So here's a typical uh, system, fairly complicated. You've got a printed circuit board which if you haven't seen this before, normally it's an uh, impregnated uh, weave of uh, fiberglass. You put copper, usually copper uh, connections on top, and then the solder ball nowadays is melted and connects onto the PCB on one side and onto the package on the other side. Now, as we'll see later on, the initial uh, chips uh, went through the board Nowadays, the chips just sit on top of the circuit board, so probably easier to make, but the solder boards are a lot smaller, so more difficult to test. And inside the package now, this is a typical package, and a lot of the CPUs are like this now. You've got another smaller circuit board, sometimes called an interposer board. This one here it can be silicon, and you've got what we call through hole wires to connect from one side to the other. And then you have multiple die, because uh, it's difficult to make very large die. So you may have two die here. You could have eight die nowadays. And these die have got um, millions or even billions of transistors on them connected onto this interposer. And then you probably need some packaging over the top to protect it. But sometimes it's just a bare die in some systems. So these are the sort of things in electronics at the moment we've got to try and design for and to test for and it's quite a challenge so most things we're dealing with are digital so why digital well if, if you work with analog it's uh, you can make some analog circuits but it's not efficient for uh, processing information in large uh, volumes it's small, it's efficient, you only you've only got two states, although in future digital will probably have more than two states. 
you've seen that can be used in mobile devices, mobile phones, laptops, and so on. Can be designed for low power and portable because it's small. It can be reprogrammed. In the early days of microprocessors, you'd write a program onto a microprocessor. If it didn't work, you could go away, reprogram or rewrite the program and keep trying until it did work. And your director mentioned about using punch cards to do COBOL programming. When I would learn to program, I used to use punch cards to do Fortran programming, being an engineer. So you'd punch the cards, it'd be entered into the uh, computer, and you'd get the output the next day. So a slow process, but now you can reprogram it instantly. Digital's low cost, it's everywhere. And all the generations are growing up used to this sort of uh, instant communication. Young children today adapt very fast and are playing with this sort of uh, devices from an early age. When it comes to design and simulation, the design is going so fast, the simulation tools have really struggled, I think, to keep up with the new products. And um, with a few major companies in the world, spent a lot of time trying to do this. And some very good uh, ECAD, which is the Electronic Computer Aid Design Systems, do exist and continue to exist. But it's predominantly for clock systems because this is what most of the designs uh, realize from. You have a clock or a number of clocks, and the whole system moves in time with the clock. So we're talking about clocks, uh, just the basics of clock systems. Uh, here in a few minutes. And tomorrow we're looking at asynchronous uh, systems. And because asynchronous uh, electronics isn't very popular, the computer aided design for asynchronous is still developing. And I'd say it's not mature enough for most people to adopt it. But asynchronous uh, circuits, as we'll see, have certain advantages in terms of low power and speed. As mentioned uh, in the introduction, quantum computing is coming in, it's in its infancy, and it's not realized really on a major commercial scale, but it probably will be in the future and shows a lot of promise. But before we start all of this, you need to still have some background in design methods. Uh, it's like learning to drive a car, you need to drive the design before you go on to an ECAN system, so you can understand what you're trying to achieve. And after you've done the design, more and more important is how to test and validate your design. So test through simulation can preempt functional testing of a real product, so it can save money in terms of building hardware that may not work. And it's becoming difficult because as things reduce in size, the components reduce in size, ICs, PCBs, and everything else, it's more difficult to test. You can't, I don't know, for the past few years, use what we call a mechanical probe. If you've got a circuit board, you want to measure the voltage, sometimes there's no room to physically put a probe onto the circuit board. So what we'll learn about later today is how to use electronic probing. The electronic probing doesn't have to insert a mechanical probe onto the board. It can measure the signals and output them via, via an input or output port to validate the circuit. Now, validation of the green virtues of uh, circuits are becoming important. The environmental issues, as you probably know, are very, very important. So I've got another avenue of research looking at green electronics. Where we're trying to use different materials to make products uh, using, to use less power to actually make them and make them more recyclable and use different materials. Uh, for example, what's happened in the electronics industry is we've tried to take all the lead out of solder. So now solder is more based on tin rather than tin and lead. So that's taken out materials we don't want to put back into the environment and created problems for designers, but problems that can't be overcome. 
And one thing I do in my own research, because I do a lot of work with the automotive or car industry, we validate electronics due to with uh, environmental testing, such as thermal cycling, taking it to different temperatures, vibration, and maybe exposing it to humidity to make sure that the final design has a good chance of working for its expected lifetime, which for an automobile could be 10, 20 or 30 years. So we can't obviously work 10, 20 or 30 years to validate some electronics. So a whole new avenue, which we're not touching on much this week, is to do accelerated testing. I've got a small case study on this on Friday. And we have to expose electronics to a harsher environment than it would normally see in the field. So if it's a 10 year lifetime, we might want to test it in a few months. And the quicker we can test it and have a good idea that it will reliably work for 10 years, it obviously saves money and energy in the testing. So once a device under test fails, we need to know why it tests. And then we go on to further analysis, which can be things like looking at the uh, circuits uh, under microscopes, uh, using x-rays, ultrasound, optics, and so on. So how we do this will be discussed later in the course, and which methods may be best to do this will also be discussed. So as we're going through, just a quick question, which you, you, I don't want you to come on the mic, but just think about it. I assume everyone will have a mobile phone or access to a mobile phone, but how long do you expect your mobile phone to work? By that, I mean, what do you expect the lifetime of your mobile phone to be? So is it 10 years? Is it five years? Is it four years? Is it two years? Is it one year? So it's a difficult question because the technology moves so fast. Most younger people, not me, because I've got an old phone, but most younger people will probably want to replace their mobile phone if they've got enough uh, cash to replace it every two to three years. Because the technology marches on, the uh, communication network changes up in uh, 1G, 2G, so on, 5G. So think about that. So if you, your mobile phone only needs to work for two years, maybe it goes to another customer for another two years, maybe four years is enough time for a mobile phone to work. But inside your mobile phone will be millions of connections. And if one of those connections breaks, your mobile device will no longer work. So this is when we're talking about reliability, trying to stop this happening to make things uh, have a longer lifetime. So we're talking about future electronics. So where are we up to now? Well, electronic devices will continue to shrink in size. I've talked about transistors using mobile phones. You can see how they go hand in hand. And from 1983 to 2017, reducing in size by a factor of 100 in terms of the uh, connection size. But if we consider a 3D transistor, such as a FinFET, you now get reduction in X, Y, and Z. So that's in three, di three dimensions. So that's 100 times 100 times 100. So really that's now a reduction in size by 1 million, which is enormous. So there's a famous design uh, from the uh, 60s and 70s called Moore's Law, which is one of the founders uh, of Intel. And he predicted way back uh, in the 60s and 70s, the number of transistors on a chip would double about every two years because it was doing that at the time. And people said it'll in the 80s and 90s, it'll never continue. But the material scientists and the engineers have managed to keep coming up with uh, new solutions for the transistors and circuit design, and it's more or less continued. So it's actually been better performance in chip chips, which is based on the number of trans transistors, and the switching speed has doubled about every 18 months. Now, I've got a busy diagram, which may be difficult to see, but you can see it on Wikipedia. 
and you can see when transistor started, it's argue, argued that the first transistor, Intel 4004, in about 1971, it had about 2,000 transistors. And then it went to 10,000 transistors with a Motorola by 1978. Then it went to 100,000 transistors, roughly by 1986, when it got to a million transistors by about 1991. And people have been saying it won't go on, but you can see this line is more or less a straight line. And now we've gone past uh, 10 billion transistors, and the latest ones have more than 50 billion transistors and the top end processors. So have a look at that, and you can see out of interest where I came in. I started working with uh, Intel 8080 1975. It had a clock rate of between 2 and 4 megahertz, virtual low memory, and then it went to 885 in 1976, and Z80 around the same time. At the time, these were really exciting things to be working on, but you could understand the exact architecture of the 8-bit microprocessor and really get the best out of it by writing in the assembly language. Nowadays, these... <laughs> Processes up here are so complicated, it would take you a long time to learn how to get the best out of them. And I don't think you'd be programming many of these in a similar language, you'd be using some high level language. So times have changed and will continue to change. Another type of scaling is after a guy called Denard. And this is also very interesting if you haven't seen it before. If you have, I apologize. But if you haven't, it, it links the chip power requirements to the semiconductor area, since both the voltage and current are proportional to length. So this uh, Denar scaling postulates that power performance per watt would grow in line with transistor density. And he assumes, and it did happen for 20, 30 years, that every generation of transistor, the dimensions are scaled by 30% down, or times 0.7. That means the transistor area, because that is scale squared, reduced by about 50%. Transistor delay is reduced by about 30%. That means the operating frequency can increase by about 40%. So if you think about it, you get more transistors per area, Delays reduced, so frequencies can go up. So it's all winning. And the second thing is, you've got to keep the electric field constant by reducing the supply voltage by 30%. Because so if you have too high electric field inside a transistor, it will cause the transistor to break down. And that reduces the energy, because the energy is voltage squared, if you remember the Ohm's law. So Reducing voltage by 30%, reduced energy by about 65%. So the power is actually reduced by 50% at 1.4 times the frequency. So it's winning everywhere again. The problem is with this, you can only reduce the supply voltage so much. If you reduce it below about half a volt, you haven't got any margin to switch between a low and a high level. So just to summarise there, it means for every new technology generation, transistor density doubles, circuits become about 40% faster, power consumption stays about the same, and the voice less accurate now is proposed in 1974, and the principle generally still applies. So I just want to take you through now a little bit of history about microprocessors. So. The first microprocessor was a 4-bit, uh, normally called the Intel 4004 in 1971. It had 2,300 transistors using 10 micron line width, which by today's standard is big, but when you consider that a human hair is maybe 100 microns plus, it's still very tiny. And it had a chip of about 12 square millimetres. But at the time, this was the state of the art. And then you look at what happens to Intel now, it's not the latest one, but the Intel i7 came out in 2017. It's got about 3 times 10 to the 9, approximately. I couldn't find out the exact figure, but about 3 billion transistors. 
now on the 40 nanometer line width for the transistors. And then had a look this weekend, Apple have now got an ARM based M1 Max 2021. And this is 57 billion transistors with a five nanometer line width. So this really is state of the art. Then another one I might to find, which isn't really a chip, just to show what you can do on a wafer scale. Wafer scale engine by this Cerebus company in 2020. 2.6 trillion transistors on seven nanometer FinFET on a 46 square millimeter area. So I've got some pictures so you can see what it looks like. This is something I'm more familiar with in my student days. The dual line package, one, two, three, four, five, six, and eight pins on the side. You soldered it through the circuit board on the other side and you connect it up. This first microprocessor doesn't work on its own. You need to use a chipset with it to get it to work. Nowadays, they tend to be more self contained. This is one of the later Intel ones. So the chips now inside this uh, spreader, this is to spread the heat because these chips generate a lot of heat. And you can see now these are passive components, probably capacitors to uh, decouple the uh, connections. And this copper grid or gold grid is all the connections you'll be making onto the chip. So again, difficult to fabricate. You've got to make every one of these these connections onto another so both is possible to probe it. If you go back to this, if you solder this pin through a board and put a solder joint on, you can quite easily physically put an oscilloscope or analyzer onto that point. So this is one uh, related chips, very complicated, uh, quite difficult design with a lot of uh, hardware inside this uh, device. And the wafer scale one, isn't really a chip because it's got memory on it as well, but just so you know, it's got 2.6 trillion transistors, what actually can be made at the moment. So that's uh, unbelievable, really. All right, so what about the future? 2018, I did a survey, 10 nanometer scaling meant there's about 100 million transistors per square millimeter. And if you can try and think what 100 million is, and think of a millimeter, and then square a millimeter. It's impossible really for me to imagine 100 million transistors on a square millimeter, very tiny in other words. And this would increase from 3.3 million in 2008. So enormous improvement. And now when I did a quick calculation on the wafer scale, I just showed you using the seven nanometer technology, it's actually 56 or so about 56 billion transistors per square millimeter. Now this, I just can't imagine, <laughs> they're just so small. Anyway, with all this technology improvement, synchronous design just can't go on forever. Because uh, for this to work, every transistor has to work, even though you can build redundancy in to these designs. So you tend to split it up into multi-chip, which is what's happened already. You'll have multi-chip in the CPUs, not just a single CPU. We've tried parallel processing. I've used it in the past, but there's problems with parallel processing, communicating with different chips. And semiconductors may not be able to advance much more. It may be replaced by other circuits, you know, yet to be designed. And I've seen uh, ideas that biotechnology could be used for switches in the future. Uh, it can be made quite small and they can be made we're trying to make them switch. And one thing that's been around a long time since the 1970s is optical switching. Because if you've got something like a laser beam expanded, it's a parallel beam. So the switching can be parallel, so very fast. And you can do optical Fourier transforms at the speed of light. The problem with optical switching is normally getting the input and output from the electronic of a real world into the switch, which I still don't think is uh, fast enough. So what's the limits to the synchronous design? Obviously the clock speed. And you've got things called clock skew, which is how the clock may uh, move as it goes across the 
chip, and this is more apparent now due to delays across the chip. You've got the speed of light, which you can't go faster than. So the speed of light, really, if you think of 30 centimetres or about one English foot, takes about one nanosecond to travel this far. Those things get smaller. Obviously, the speed goes down, but the speed of light is still a limitation. If you've got 100 watts uh, power generated in a chip, which we have nowadays, you've got to somehow radiate that power away from the chip, otherwise you'll destroy the CPU. So this is now a problem. We've got air cooling, water cooling, probably uh, in the top systems, uh, liquid nitrogen cooling and so on. So the power is a problem. So that may take us away from silicon. If the chip core temperature goes up, uh, the reliability will go down. So this is something to keep an eye on. Design tools have limits. Different design tools can only cope with so many gates. Fabrication is becoming uh, difficult. And uh, recently, what a reduced number of chip foundries who could make the top level chips. But due to changes in the world business scenario, I've noticed over the past six months, a lot more companies now are trying to set up chip foundries in their own countries, which is a good thing. Because small chip foundries means you can make the chips more locally, which is good for green technologies because you're not transporting electronics all around the world. Test and validation needs to move on as well. As things get smaller, it's more difficult to inspect and test. And new physical effects will dominate as you scale down. For example, uh, professor I work with in, uh, I used to work at a university in Hong Kong. He was looking at thermal migration, electron migration. And as we scale down, these effects may come in to uh, interfere with how your circuit works. So electron migration is when elements are drawn towards uh, anode or cathode, and it may give you uh, potential problems in switching and thermal migration when you've got hot and cold services. Again, at semi to level, things will drift across and can cause problems. So I'm not dwelling on that, it's just to point out that as we scale things down, other effects will come into play. So what's nanotechnology in future electronics? Well, I think nanotechnology is still developing over the past 10 years. Some of existing approaches will apply, but we need new design requirements because different things come into play as well. And device switching speeds and interconnection time will be critical. As we scale down in interconnection length, interconnection times become similar to the switching speeds of a device. And um, hopefully switching speeds will still be quicker than the time to interconnect. If not, we really are in trouble. So have a think about as switching speeds come down, how far between the next uh, clock cycle, for example, can the signal travel in the chip? And you'd be horrified how small that area is, or that length is. A thing called nanowires are coming out. They offer small size transistors. And we've got high electron mobility and fastest switching with existing designs. And took level width from 1 to 100 nanometers. But again, they're still in the infancy. And single molecule devices, sometimes called molecular electronics, uh, apparently, I'm not an expert on this, but can be self-assembled. So one thing I've worked on in the past is reconfigurable designs, such as reconfigurable FPGAs. So you can reconfigure some of these devices as the circuit's running. Um, using molecular electronics, it's proposed that you can get the size of these devices, well, the small diodes have made so far to about half a nanometer. So this is something for the future, and it could be covered by some of our colleagues this week. So just quickly, in the next 15 minutes, to finish this out, I want to just take you through some basic state machine examples. So this will help when it comes to looking at how we design some of the testing circuits uh, later this afternoon. So finite state machines are clocked sequential circuits. If you've done a 
degree or some type of basic electronic course, you should know about these type of uh, circuits. Their counters, for example, have a fixed number of states and were generated sequentially. So you may have a decade counter, not up to nine, then it repeats. Some more complex finite state machines are found controlling microcomputers and it's, it really looks at the present state and the past states and can generate a sequence. So how do you do with design? So we'll just run through a couple of simple designs. Just so you know when I do some of my testing how I do it. You've got to know how many states you need. And as a designer, you can specify the states and assign the states to the design using noughts and ones. Then we draw a state transition diagram to show how we move between the states and show how the transition take place. Then to change that into a design, we tabulate it. We code the states. And then we, from a state table, assign binary values. And it's a form of truth table from which we can get a final design, clock design. There's two basic types named after people from the 70s, Moore and Mealy. Uh, one is uh, pure synchronous, the other one is synchronous but allows asynchronous outputs. So what we're going to look at is a, a parity checker and a vending machine very quickly just so you can see what the design procedure is and then we'll take a short break. So if you haven't heard of parity before, parity is the number of digits in a binary number. Odd parity indicates an odd number of ones and even parity normally indicates an even number of ones. So if you've got a number here, 0011001010, we've got four ones in that uh, number, so that's even parity. And another number here, we've got 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. We've got five ones in this number, so we call that odd parity. And these sort of parity checks used to be used a lot for asynchronous communication checking. And you'd have it a parity bit to set the parity to even or odd. So when the data came in or went out, you could check it. So it's a real type of thing. So a different uh, state transition diagram. I'll run through the more first and come back and do the melee in a minute. So a more. And you've got two states, an even state where the output zero, and an odd state where we've made the output one. And in state transition diagram, the arcs show you what the input is, and on the clock where we move. So the stable states are even and odd. If the input is at naught and the clock comes in, we just stay in the even state. So normally we don't show this one because we just stay in the state, but for completeness, I've put it in here. If we're in an even state and a one comes in, clearly we're going from even to odd. So this arc takes us with a one input on the next clock cycle to odd. And if we're in odd and a one comes in, we go back to even. So if ones are coming in, we're cycling between. If noughts are coming in, we're staying in the same state. So if we look at the more table, if we're in an even state and naught comes in, we stay in even state. If we're in an even state and a one comes in, we go to the odd state and the output matches the present state. So even as an output of naught, present state odd has an output of one and so on. It's already minimized, so just looking at the top diagram here, if we've assigned even naught and odd one, that's the state encoding on the top table. So using D flip-flops, state encoding for a more gives us this table. So the clock's here, the control of the next state input D is the input exclusively odd, which is this gate with the present output. So if you look at the table, you'll see that present state and input, not, 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 not one, one, not one, 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 not. This is the true table of an exclusive OR gate. And the present output is not, not, Naught naught in the present state and the present state one one gives the present output one one. So you can see here the output just comes straight from the queue and the D input or the next state input is the exclusive all. So that's a quick more design. If we just look at the Mealy design now, Mealy design doesn't have to work for the wait for the uh, 
clock. I prefer the more design because it works on the clock and it's, uh, I'd say, for most designs, uh, preferred. On the Mueller design, the output changes with the change in input. So if we start with a naught on an even state, a naught comes in, this is the output stays at a naught. If we're in an even state and a one comes in, we immediately change the output to one as we jump from even to odd state. If we're in the odd state and a naught comes in, we just stay in a one on the uh, transition. If we're in the odd state, and the one comes in, we're changing back to naught. So when we do the tabulation, there's a slight difference. You see even, odd, even, odd is the same, but the even, when the next state is even, stays at naught. If the next state is odd, it immediately changes the output to one for a melee, whereas for a more, the next state stays at an even until the next clock pulse. So that's a subtle change. So when you go through the design, you see that the present state and the next state are still the exclusive all. The next state here, uh, naught, naught gives you naught, naught, one gives you one, one, naught gives you one, one, one gives you naught is exclusive all for the next state. And the present state, you can see, is based on naught, one, one, five. Yeah. The output actually comes out from the gate there. So if we just look at that, the next state and the present output are the same for a melee. So we can just take the output from here. So the difference is for the more circuit, the output only changes on the clock cycle and the state is rotated around based on the inputs and the feedback on the melee circuit. The output is based on the present state and the present input. So it changes before the clock, whereas the state of a, the state through this D time only advances with the clock. So this has advantages, but if you want something to come in that doesn't have to wait for a clock, it can immediately interrupt uh, uh, this output can interrupt a circuit. But this one has to wait. So different applications, I'd say in may, most cases people will be used in this because it's a fairly steady operation. There's no spurious response on the input. You have to wait for the clock. But if you want uh, an emergency input to change without waiting for the clock, the melee comes into its own. And then sometimes in some circuits, it merely may need less stages than a more circuit. So just quickly, I want to run through one more example uh, before we take a short break. So this is a vending machine. How does it work? Well, it could be vending coffee or water or whatever. You've got a coin sensor. It's got an N and a D, which is short for nickel and dime. You've got a vending machine, final state machine, which we're going to design. So obviously, People sometimes miss this stuff. You need a reset to reset any state machine to its initial state and a clock to progress for states. Then you, when you've received enough money on a coin sensor, you open a release mechanism to release the product. So when we do a state transition diagram, we go to reset, which resets to no cents. We're working in cents here. A nickel is five. Cents like takes us to five. Another nickel takes us to 10. Another nickel takes us to 15. 15 cents is enough to open the mechanism. So that then out, puts an output to one, which would deliver the product. The other way is a dime is 10 cents, so that goes from 0 to 10. And a nickel or a dime would take you to 15. But you'd be a bit silly to put another dime in, because 10 plus 10 means you've put 20 cents in. So if this machine doesn't give change, you've wasted 5 cents. So when you do the present state, you can see all the different combinations of inputs. Some aren't possible, you, you won't put two one in here and so on. You get the present output and just to run through the process quickly, you develop it into this coding. We now code up uh, naught naught for no cents, naught one for one cent, one naught for 10 cents into the uh, output there. 
And you can do the same thing for melee, but I won't dwell on melee. When you do a minimization for more, you've got outputs for Q, for Q, D1, D0, and open. And obviously, when you're doing corner maps, you're looking for the biggest groups you can take along with the don't care, which are the X's. So the biggest groups are one to a group of eight there, D1, then another group of eight here, and a group of four. And for D0, you've got a group of four, a group of four around the side, another group of four there, and a group of four on the bottom. And for opening the uh, mechanism, you've got four ones in a group there. So here's a more design. Two D-type flip-flops. Here are the steering gates to develop D1 and D0. And when Q1 and Q0 are both true, you've got an AND gate there to open up the mechanism. So, just wanted to run through that quickly before we go on to the rest of the course. As a clock baked circuits can be implemented in clocked hardware with steering logic gates, so quite simple. And they used to be built on circuit boards through discrete logic, but nowadays you can use programmable logic or any other type of hardware available, such as an FPGA, to make these sorts of circuits. And if you're going to do this type of uh, clock design, you can also design both versions, a more and a melee, and see which one might work best for your application. So that's the end of that part. So I don't know if you want to take a short break for 10 minutes before we move on to the testing. I don't know who's there. Is anybody there? Is anybody there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I've, lost, I've lost the window somehow. Okay, okay now sir. I can see. Should we take a short break for 10 minutes? Yes, sir. Sure, sure. Over oh, seven minutes, so we start again at. Uh... Okay. Is that four o'clock your time? You have a break and start at four p.m. Yes, sir. We can have the break. Sir. Yes. Okay, we'll have a short break now and start again at four p.m. Sure, sir. Okay. On the testing. Okay. Okay, so okay. See you shortly okay, then.
Hello, Samia, you there? Yes, sir, I'm there, sir. Should I start sharing the screen for the next one? Sure, sir. I'm trying to share the screen now and one second. Hello. <laughs> I'll try and share it now. Just uh... is that okay? Yes, sir. It is completely okay, sir. Okay. So what, what I'm planning to do now, this is quite a long presentation. I'll do about one hour and have a break, five or ten minutes, then the second part. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, sure, sir. As you want to proceed. Should we start now then? Are people back? Do we know? Yeah, uh, yeah of course. I hope uh, time is also uh, okay. So we can go ahead, sir. Okay, I'll start then. I'll see you shortly. Sure, sir. Okay. Okay, so welcome back for those that made it back. <laughs> so. The second part of today is about uh, testing. Something I was very interested in in uh, well, I'll say the past 30 years of my career because it's uh, became very difficult to test electronic components uh, during making research uh, circuits and also uh, boards like microcomputers or boards to plug into computers because the, the when when circuits became surface mounts it can be impossible to probe circuits using mechanical probes so very difficult to test so you need to have some other technique and luckily a lot of work was going on in the test area and some people might think testing might be a bit boring but actually the test development now is a major topic and worth spending some time on. So the roadmap about what I want to talk about today is the how and the why to test, how we design for test. Then we go on to scan based testing, which is uh, fairly established. And we do an overview of boundary scan testing, which was very important when it came in in the 1990s. So, the things we go through, we have some introduction, and then we talk about design for test, uh, as I said, scan path methods, which includes multiplex data flip flop, the only two main methods, multiplex outputs, and then how you might want to generate test inputs using hardware rather than software. How you may want to analyze the outputs. And then a new thing that came up, uh, well, not so new now, but in late 70s, block testing. Then JTAG came in in the 1990s, boundary scan testing, which is very important for circuits uh, on the... Uh, oops, now, <laughs> now I've lost my... I don't know, I can see electromagnetic waves on my screen. Is that <laughs> somebody taking over my screen? Hello, Sonia, you there? What do you see? So there are waves uh, going on, so we can see that only, so. But the waves aren't from me. Somewhere else uh, has put the waves on. So uh, I would like to go through that participants if anybody would like to go through this. I'm not sure. Somebody put something on the screen, but it's gone. Anyway, can you see my screen now? No, sir, it is not visible. You have taken back your, uh, I hope screen sharing is off uh, right now. So you have to again share your screen and uh, uh, go ahead, oh. sir. Okay, one second, so how do we get back? Okay. 
Can you see now? Yeah, it's getting uploaded, sir. Yeah, I think somebody, I think somebody took, maybe one of the delegates shared his screen <laughs> or her screen. Okay. Okay. Maybe okay, you need okay. to disable. No, disable Maybe you need to disable the screen saving for till we, the end of a session, then people can show me. Anyway. Yeah, now it's, now it is visible, sir. I hope you are on a roadmap. We we are able to see that roadmap of like boundary scan. Okay. So the same. Screen. That's fine. That's fine. I'll carry on. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. 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 So back to the roadmap. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. So talking about boundary scan and not in detail because it's uh, quite a complicated thing, but how to apply boundary scan and what it can be used for in uh, PCB and ASICs and uh, other chips and then a summary at the end. So when you're in university mode, which some may still be in, some are in industry, why do we test? Well, normally we'll test things at a basic level like uh, an AND gate to make sure that the logic is correct on the gates. So we're ensuring that device specifications are met. So to start with, we just do a test on the input output behavior. Uh, that may be a logical behavior, but for industrial applications, you need to also be worried about the frequency. Now, how fast can that circuit switch or how slow? What are the timings between that circuit and other circuits? Which can be quite difficult to uh, solve if there's a problem. The so functional tests are more, I'd say, like university type uh, or college type uh, testing. But in the real world, you then need to add in environmental tests. And I've done a lot of this because I've been working for 20 years with automotive industry. And environmental tests means will your product work, for example, in the field in a car, lorry, or bus, or train, or aeroplane, which was mentioned earlier? And things do fail. So the environmental testing is to try to stop it failing when it may cause you know, a catastrophe or loss of life or maybe something less when your car might just break down or electric bike might break down, which maybe is not so critical. But you know, if it's an accident, it is critical. So we have to monitor power. By power, it could be, you know, is the thing overheating? Uh, is the power from the battery sufficient and so on? Uh, will the power cycling uh, be sufficient for a long life of a product? So low power is better, obviously, in today's climate. We, we're talking about green electronics, we want low power systems, uh, but some things uh, like a car, we have enormous batteries in an electric car, for those people that have enough money to buy one, and those batteries can overheat on occasions and go on fire and things like this have to be tested and even you may know that some uh, lithium type batteries in mobile phones for a short time had a fault or design fault were able to go on fire which isn't good so we have to consider temperature and the example i've got here is if you're running a car in a country like india or the most to a country like the uk the temperature differences on a daily life cycle, the car will experience are different. India could be you know, 0 to 40 degrees, UK it might be minus 10 to 20 degrees. So you have to take these into consideration. So when we're doing temperature measurements, quite often on the products I'm looking at, we take the cycle from minus 55 degrees C all the way up to plus 130 degrees C. And we cycle it around about half an hour each uh, temperature for a period of months, could be six months, to see if that product will survive. So it's quite a complicated and expensive way of testing. Some things that may be susceptible to humidity. So you're running a product in a place like uh, Singapore near the equator. Humidity will be nearly 100%. So you need to make sure that you know with no water or any condensation getting into your product because water and electricity doesn't tend to mix very well. But another thing I've been keen on for a number of years is the EMC requirements, which stands for electromagnetic compatibility. 
and I used to do testing for local industry in Liverpool based on EMC where you need the chamber, you need uh, RF equipment to measure uh, emissions from your electronics. Uh, is it emitting a frequency that may interfere with someone else's electronics? And the other side is, is it susceptible to radiation from other people's electronics? So it's a big field EMC. You could spend your whole career looking at EMC of devices. So for example, if you've got a mobile phone, and if you turn your mobile phone on and somehow it interferes with the electronics control system of a car and stops it working, it wouldn't be a good thing. So we have to design all products to be compatible with all other products, which yeah, is difficult. We have to test for reliability. So uh, in the past, I've seen uh, coming Liverpool making telephone exchanges. So all the chips coming in uh, on what we call the subscriber line interfacing with telephone lines were tested before they were put onto the printed circuit board to test for the quality of the chips was sufficient before they were manufactured. So you have to test that on anything coming in really. Nowadays, a lot of this uh, quality testing is put back onto a manufacturer. So you test reliability of a chip coming in, you solder it or connect it onto a circuit board, and then you have to monitor the failure rate. So obviously devices with low failure rate or systems with low failure rate will be popular. If you're making a car that breaks down every day, very soon you'll be out of business. And if that's down to the electronics, you need to do something about it. So very quickly, I want to run through, if you were in a company and you wanted to start a, a test department, uh, 20 years ago, electronics companies have a design department and a separate test department. So you'd have to train up personnel to do test testing, which are probably uh, former design engineers with some know-how. You need to train the personnel to do it, technicians as well as engineers. You need the equipment to do it. You need to use equipment, which can be quite complex. And you probably can't test a complex system in one go. You have to break it down using what we call divide and conquer. Partition with design, so you can test parts of it uh, in isolation. And if possible, can you do on site repair and maintenance, which for complex systems now is becoming more difficult? So, how do you go through it? Well, we're all engineers. You need to be logical and methodical when you're doing testing. It's always worth reading the manual, which no one wants to do, but sometimes there's tips in user manuals about how to test things. And if it's quality documentation, you might be the person writing it or using it. So you got to be trained in general electronic testing. Um, you need an appropriate workshop and maybe you need some spares if there's things you can change to repair things. So basic mechanical toolkit, you could set this up in your lab or you could even set it up at home if you're that way out. You need a basic mechanical toolkit, spanners and screwdrivers and so on to dismantle things. Digital volumeters are very useful. You can measure voltages, resistances, currents, uh, sometimes test transistors on voltmeters. Oscilloscope is very good. Now they're very portable and you can probably even get interfaces now into your mobile de devices or laptop. I used to like using logic analyzers. This is where you Bring in digital waveforms and see how they interact with each other. Enables you to fault find very easily. The spectrum analyzer will let you do a thing like a phosphor transform to see where the uh, on certain things it might be useful. Signal generator is good to generate sine waves or square waves to do the testing. And sometimes if you've got computer-based tools with a proper diagnostic software, you can plug this in on some type of uh, umbilical cord type connector and uh, see what's going on. And sometimes an IC tester might be useful. They got to localize the faults and use, use a systematic approach. And you go through it in turn. I don't want to dwell too much on this. So let's go on to design for test, which is what as engineers you should be doing anyway. When you're doing a circuit design, 
you should think about after you've or during the design, how are you going to design it with test in mind from the start? So when you've made a complicated circuit, how can you or a manufacturer test it? Once you work that out, you want to find any faults before the system is uh, shipped to a customer. Because uh, if you ship it to a customer, the fault in the field will be far more costly. And we're talking about an order of magnitude higher than in the factory or workshop. And we build it in design for test, IC level, PCB level, at all the levels to find a fault. If you've got a fault free system, company embarrassment is minimized. If you've got a faulty system, uh, the company will probably not be too happy and something needs to be done about it. So here's a graph I've got from the industry. It's quite an old graph, but it still applies. And it's a cost of ownership of a fault. It's a sort of multiplier. If you get a chip or package failing, you say it's one time, it may cost you, say, 100 rupees. If you then sold it or manufactured that package onto a printed circuit board, you've done a bit more work. It's got to buy a factor of 10. So 100 rupees now becomes 1,000 rupees. If you then put that PCB in a system, uh, it could be a right mounted system, or it could be even in a computer. It's gone up another 10 times. When you ship that to a customer, which could be anywhere in the world, it's gone up another 100, another 10 times. So from the simple IC to a customer, the cost of fixing that fault has gone up a thousand times. So you can see if you can weed out or find any faults at a package level, it could save a lot of money later on, which is one reason why we do the testing. So because it's uh, its own field, a few things have come up. I just want to show you a few test parameters which people talk about when, when you're dealing with tests, which we're not dwelling on too much apart from testability. But one's called controllability, the first one. And this is the ability to set an internal net or wire inside, say, a chip or a circuit to a specific logic value by using the primary inputs. In other words, it's how to control the circuit connection from the input. So if it's the input itself, the controllability is 100%. If an input goes through, say, a two input AND gate and onto another gate, it's going down because you have to set the gate to a certain condition to enable the network to be set to a certain condition. And sometimes you can't set it, so you then have to go in and then you redesign the circuit to improve the controllability. Observability is the same thing, but from the output side, if you've got an output driving uh, an output pin, clearly the observability from that pin is 100%, but if you go to the other side of a gate driving the output pin, the observability will go down. So you can spend a lot of time trying to improve this on certain types of circuits, which used to be important, but maybe less so nowadays, because we can now probe internally to increase both these parameters. And the testability, which I've got a small exercise later on, is the number of inputs we can detect a certain fault condition divided by the power of a number of inputs. So if you've got a four input circuit, two to the four would be 16, so how many of the 16 possible inputs would detect the fault? So you're probably all experienced enough to know as an engineer, you don't tend to get something for nothing. So the practicalities of design for test or you're adding in usually extra hardware. So when you put extra hardware into your circuit, it will normally affect the circuit performance. So that means it will probably slow down the maximum speed, could slow down the response time and so on. Additional logic will be required, so that's to increase overhead. So the increased logic itself could fail. So that's not a good thing, but it's only very minor usually. But the savings will be afforded later because you have reduced test times if you've got design for tests built in improved field service and the main thing, better reliability. So initial costs may be slightly higher, 
but the total cost will be reduced. Another advantage of building in design for test is people want a very high fault grade or percentage uh, potential fault grade testing percentage up in the 90 percent. So if you've got no design for test built in, and you're trying to develop test patterns just on the standard uh, design. After a period of months, you may only have covered 70% of all the possible faults, which probably isn't good enough anyway. But if you go to a customer saying you want 90% of the possible faults covered, if you use design for test strategies, the higher curve here, you may get up to 90%. Somewhere around here, which is a matter of days or weeks. So, say in one or two weeks, you've got to 90% fault coverage. Uh, in this, without design for test, you may never actually get there. So, it means you can't sell the product if that's a requirement. If you want to get to 70% fault coverage, or six, let's look at 60%. 60% without any strategies takes a matter of days. And with design for testing, it can be done in a matter of hours. So you can see the advantages of trying to make reliable designs more efficiently. So the design for test improves the long-term costs. So if you've got case one, economic optimum one here, the cost is quite high per product. And the fault coverage is quite low. And in this case, it's probably rushed out. It could be in the market first, it may not without design for test, but the overall cost is higher. You can see the optimum is there, and as time goes on to get a fault coverage up, it really goes high. And it's probably not economic. Whereas number two, you've got full design for test techniques use. The cost for fault coverage is a lot lower. The curve's a lot uh, lower down in the cost range. And economic optimum two is a lot lower, maybe half, economic optimum one so it's the cheaper way or better way to sell your product and reliability is actually better as well so it's a win-win cheaper cost and better reliability so this is one that comes out of a study done by automotive industry with motorola delco used to work with not this particular branch, but Delco used to make a lot of automotive systems, dashboards and electronics. Motorola had a production facility with them making chips to go in things like engine controllers. And if you look at this curve, if the defect parts per million, and at automotive in those days, you may want 100 parts per million. Now you want, might want even less. But to get 100 parts per million defect level, and a practical test means you need to have a full coverage of 99.9%, which is really high. So this is really difficult to achieve. If you wanted full defect level of 1,000 parts per million, you're going to need a full coverage of just over 99%. So again, it's really high. So these are the sort of things we're trying to achieve, particularly in automotive electronics. <laughs> So if you've now got an automotive or any controller with more than a single AC on a single IC, and say you've got a, a chip that's got 200, 250 parts per million reliability, and you want to get uh, better than 250 parts per million, to get more than one chip on the board, is nearly impossible. So, so say you have a 500 parts one defect level, you can only have two chips which have 250 parts per million defect level. So 500 parts per million down here, two chips at 250 or one chip at 500. So the more chips you put on the board going down this uh, right hand side, the more reliable you need each chip to be. So if you've got five chips on the board, you need the parts million rate per chip to be 100, the defect failure rate to be better than 100 parts million. So we, the answer here is try and use the minimum number of ASICs or minimum number of chips 
that you can get away with, even though the chips now can be very large. So a lot of work is done on design for test fault simulation. And again, you could spend your whole career looking at this. We just touch on it, the surface here. So fault patterns are very difficult to uh, dream up. And we've got to detect faults. So the standard models used over a number of years are what we call a stuck at one module, where one of the nodes or connections is shorted to the power rail, typically five volts, or nowadays maybe three volts or 2.7 volts, or a stuck at zero fault, where a node's shorted to a ground rail or no volts. So when it's stuck at one of these levels, when we do some digital scans, this, this uh, node won't change. So we try to flush this out as a fail. So we can compare response of a circuit with a fault tree circuit. If the circuit response is different, we know fault's been detected. These test patterns need skills to develop. And some of the patterns are developed on huge software systems that still need to be connected into the hardware. So some methods I want to go through fairly quickly, only a couple of slides are called ad hoc methods, which is something the old test engineers would use. They're not really designed for tests, but you retrofit or you add them into designs, it usually means a redesign of a circuit board. So this costs money and it delays the manufacture of the product, so better to use design for test. So it's built in from the start. But it takes skill to know what to do, where to put test points, for example, and as I say, it's now probably becoming obsolete. But if you're doing things, you know, and you're the only guy available or the only person available to do the testing, it's useful to know a few techniques. So we can obviously improve the ability to test by putting in a test point. Test point enables you to hang a probe on it, it's a mechanical test point. The electronic test point enables you to read a signal. So you can bring out a signal external to the chip, for example. If you've got a pin, which is an input or output pin, normally an output pin, if you multiplex that pin, it's like a funnel, you can maybe get more than one signal into that pin, two to one multiplexing, four to one multiplexing and so on. Bring more signals out, which don't normally come out of a chip, just to, just to monitor what's going on. If you want to segment the chip, you can use what's called blocking logic, can be something similar like an AND gate. So you put an AND gate input to NORT. One of the inputs to NORT, it blocks uh, the other inputs from passing through the AND gate. You switch that input back to one, it allows the circuit to progress. So in this way, you can help partition circuits. Sometimes you can use what's known as control and observation switching by switching difficult to control or observed nodes again with a type of multiplexer to nodes which are closer to the input or output to improve the uh, ability to monitor them. And this can be extended to what we call a test state register where you can log certain things into a register and you can clock it out in serial fashion later on. And the beauty about these things, we don't impose the constraints on the designer. But all these methods, because they are ad hoc, they cannot readily be automated as software is not compatible with these type of methods. So the next slide I want people to try, not necessarily now, if you can do it uh, in the next break and we can have a look at it or we can look at it tomorrow. If you've got an exercise like this, so looking at testability here, We've got three inputs, X, Y, and Z. And we've got three, two input on gates, and we've got an output, which is a function of X, Y, and Z. And all these nodes are connected. X uses node A to connect into this on gate. Y uses node B and C to connect into this on gate, and D to connect into this on gate, and so on. What happens if any of these nodes, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, get stuck at a node or a one? What happens to the output? And how easy is it to detect if one of these nodes gets a fault, such as stuck at an auto one at the output? 
So, measure the testability by the number of input patterns that detect this fault, divided by two to the number of inputs. So you can see there there's three inputs, x, y, z. So two to the power three is eight. So how many patterns uh, detect the fault over eight will give us the testability. And what I want you to look at is B stuck at a naught. So if you look at node B, node B is going to be stuck at a naught. So that means it's, it's somehow during manufacture or fabrication got shorted to ground. So when the input cycles with, a, you draw up a truth table, X, Y, Z, it can go from naught, 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 up to one, 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 and everything in between. So there's eight possible combinations. Any time that Y is going to a one, which is half the time, nodes B, C, and D are all connected to this same node, will be stuck at a naught. And how does that affect the output when it ripples through the circuit? Oops. So for, I've drawn a truth table here for a, a fault three circuit, just so we can see. So X, Y, and Z is here. The inputs are naught, 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 one, naught, one, naught, and so on up to one, one, one. And the output is a pure AND function. So the output is all zero apart from when the inputs are one, one, one. The output is one. What's going to happen next is we can now add in the hidden nodes A to H in the truth table. So you've got X, Y, Z again, the inputs naught, 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 up to one, one, one. Now you've added in A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and F. You can see how the nodes change. So, for example, A will follow X, one, one, one becomes one, 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 and so on. And the output is the same as the previous table. It only is an output of one when the inputs X, Y, and Z are all one. So it's a pure AND function. So what happens now? And B is stuck at naught. So you can try it on your own and see if you get the right answer. So if these uh, ones in the B entry are now a zero, that will ripple through into the rest of the table. So how does it affect the other nodes and how does it take, affect the output? And what's the difference? Is there any difference or what is the difference in the output? between this one, which is a fully working circuit, and a circuit that's got a fault. And you can try all the different faults. You've got B stuck at the naught for one uh, exercise, G stuck at the naught for another, and G stuck at a one for another. And you can find out the testability of each of these three faults. And you'll be amazed, because we've been talking about 99.9% .9 testability, how low this testability is for this circuit. I was another one if you've got time over the next couple of days or I haven't got a solution for this, you can look at a four bit LU, we can add them sub subtract two four bit numbers, and you can estimate the testability of each node of your ALU circuit. And it's up to you how you design the ALU, you can design it with gates, half adders, full adders, whatever. Okay. <laughs> I just want to introduce uh, scan path methods and then we'll take a break before we go into uh, built in testing. <clears throat> so, scan path methods uh, have been around quite a while, introduced by companies such as the Hewlett Packard. Um, the structured test methods, which allow more effective testing by controlling internal circuit nodes and or probing internal circuit nodes. And there's two basic types, uh, both uh, different in the uh, way that they probe a circuit. Multiplex data flip-flop, which can control and probe circuits, and multiplex data input-output or multiplex data I.O. that can only probe circuits, but very powerful techniques. So here's a typical uh, circuit in short form using a multiplex data flip-flop. So a Huffman type circuit is your standard uh, clock circuit we had before. Uh, so you, in this case, you've got a clock going into a D-type flip-flop. Another D-type flip-flop there. 
the Q outputs go into some logic, combinational logic. So all the outputs go into a logic if they're required and produce the next state logic, which for example is Y1N, comes back into the D type and sequences the circuit. It could be a counter, shift register, or whatever. So what we do for multiplex data flip flop, we add in the multiplexer, a two to one multiplexer of the input of each D type flip flop. So a slight change to the circuit. So the existing switching circuit is a D type with the combination logic. For multiplex data flip flop, we add in this two to one multiplexer at each stage. There's only two stages shown there. Obviously, normally you'd have more stages. Uh, as long as the register is, if it's eight, an eight bit register, you'd have eight multiplexes added in. If it's a 16 bit register, you'd add in 16 multiplexes. So you've got to preserve the operation when you're adding test uh, hardware. So you've got inputs coming to the logic if you've got them. You've got outputs coming out if you've got them. You may have outputs from the individual uh, D types as well coming out as outputs, or may come through the logic. And how do we switch it on? Well, to preserve normal operation, we have a control line here, test not normal, going into here. So not normal means it's active low, which is the zero. So if we're in the not normal, which is really the normal operation, we take the input, the feedback input Y1, then which is the next state input into here, through the naught onto D. So when we clock this D type, the next state is determined by this input here. On this other D type, the next state logic Y N dash in is coming in through the naught multiplexer into D to reuse for the next state. So circuit works as normal, but with some additional delay now going through a two to one multiplexer, which is two or three gates, which is fairly minimal, but it will slow down the maximum clock speed. So when we go into test mode, which is what we're adding in, this is now a one, test is one to make it active high. So we take the one input of a multiplexer, so we can now put a serial test input on the scan input uh, line. And um, when we're in the scan input mode, every time we clock the D type, the scan input advances down the D uh, flip flop. If you've got 16 D flip flops, you need 16 clock pulses to load up the D type. If you've got four D types, you need four clock pulses and so on. So we'll see the sequence next. Normal mode secondary data wise passed directly through the multiplexer. In test mode, it's scanned through the shift register chain. And as you're scanning uh, test data in, you can scan the previous result out at the same time through the same chain. So if you look at what's happening, if we scan the input here of a clock, when we switched into the test mode, we're scanning data out and we'll scan output as well. And in some cases, the scan output may be the same as one of the normal outputs. So there's no additional pin. So to do it, you add an additional hardware, maybe an additional pin for scan input and one additional control pin. So the beauty of this is you can control and observe nodes using this uh, multiplex data flip flop. So what we can do is we can observe what's coming out of Y1N, YN in by applying a clock pulse on the multiplexer and we can put things in on the scan chain and by applying a pulse on the D type apply them into the circuit. We can apply a uh, test data in and read it out. So it's quite a powerful technique. So what's the sequence? I'll go through it here then we'll look at the circuit. Test not normal is one, that's for scan mode. We shift in the test patterns by the scan input. We set the required inputs if there is any on the primary input, which are the X inputs. Then we wait a short time for any propagation delays in the logic to settle down. Then we can check the primary outputs, the Z outputs from the uh, logic. Then we go test not normal equal naught, apply a single clock pulse, that then clocks 
test uh, data into the uh, combinational logic. Then we shift back to test not null is one. And we can shift out all results through the logic. So if you look at that again, so first of all, we go into scan mode, we load up the scan register where the test is one. Go into null to apply a single pulse. That means whatever's stored in the D type now goes into the logic. And once the inputs are applied, we'll let everything settle down. We can then read any outputs, which are the Z outputs. Normally we call it Z, normally we call these primary inputs X. Then we can go back. So now the data that was entered into the logic is stored. We can go back into the scan mode, go into test mode and scan all that data we've collected from the logic count. Then we can put in another sequence and so on. So just to make sure that the sequence is working, we can test the flip-flops by shifting in strings of data. So that means we've put things along this shift register chain. Normally we can put all zeros through, all ones, and then we'll do patterns like one, zero, one, zero to make sure that it's switching. And then so there's no fault with a, a clock toggling, we'll put a string in something like zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one along this chain to do testing along that actual scan path. Okay. So the last one on this section is multiplex data input output. And this is just purely an observational technique. So on the top now you can see the clocks driving the D type. And there's no additional hardware around the D type. The next day, so the output of the D type goes into the logic, for example, Y1 out. And the next data input for D1 here is Y1 not in, comes back into the D type. So the circuit on top is this typical Huffman clock type circuit with next day logic here, combinational logic, inputs and outputs. And we just put the multiplexer on to all the Q outputs, so very little degradation in circuit apart from driving this line and the inputs of multiplexer, not as much as the previous circuit. And then we can have an address register or some type of multiplexer selection to select how many serial data outputs we want from multiplexer. It might be one at a time, two at a time or whatever. And we can observe what's going on in this circuit. Now the beauty about this multiplex data I.O., we don't have to start and stop the circuit like the multiplex data flip-flop. We can observe it at any, at any time we want. We simply hit the select button on the multiplexer, that can be logged into the multiplexer, either in a gateway or this could be a register, and then we output it through some output pins. So data normally entered into multiplexer in parallel from each of the outputs. We can select which outputs to sample. It can only observe nodes. So there's no control possible from the additional circuitry. The circuit will just run as it normally runs. And we can observe internal loads during normal system operation, which aren't normally available. And it's only very minor circuit degradation, as I say, due to adding in an additional line to an additional input. And sometimes some ICs have multiplexers already on the output pin, so you can utilize this to make it a bit more efficient. OK. So I think that I just want to take a short break before we go on to the last part. I don't know if Anyone's there? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Should, should we take a short break for 10 minutes before the last part? Yeah, you can have to. You can have to. I can't see. I don't know what's happening on my screen. How do I get the screen back? Do you know? Am I visible? I've got it back, yeah. Okay. You can have so it like minutes. Yeah. I, I, I had to click on something. Yes, I've done it. So we'll come back in uh, in ten uh, 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 on the hour. Do you want to come back on the hour? Fifteen minutes. Okay. Okay. We can have fifteen minutes, Rick. So okay. And then we'll finish off the last bit.
Okay. Okay. Sure. See you shortly. Okay.
Hello, Samia. Yes, sir. Shall I just share the screen, start again? Yes, sir, you can do that. Okay, I'm starting. Hey, nice to see you. <laughs> okay, so what, what I'm planning to do now is finish off the lecture, and if there's any Q and A at the end, we can have some questions if there's any coming in. Have you yes, got any questions yet? Or wait yeah. to the end. Currently, also if participants are having hello, questions, hello. questions, yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, so what do we questions at the end then? Uh, do we need much time for questions or don't we know? Participant side, can anyone uh, coordinate with that? With the, uh, sir, uh, uh, you would like, sir, to have question answers or uh, we can continue with the same lecture? Well, let's finish the lecture first and then we'll do the question at the end. Yeah. Sure, then we can go ahead with uh, the lectures, I hope. Okay, and then if we, we can't finish your question today, we can do it tomorrow with no problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll try and it's share the screen then. Okay. Okay, I'll see you shortly. Is it okay, can you see it? Yes, sir, I can see. Okay. Well, welcome back. We'll now move on to built-in self-tests. So sometimes it was called built-in test, B-I-T, but I think built-in self-test uh, is a better term. And the idea is the previous scan path, me scan path methods uh, although they're very clever, you need expensive test gear to generate the test vectors to apply to the product, and also you need to take the outputs out to analyze, you know, once you've applied the test vectors or the test inputs, what's the response of a circuit under test? So the idea of built-in self-test is it moves most of the tester functions on the chip or in the circuit reducing the complexity of an external tester. Uh, I've seen some of these external tests in the past and they can be very expensive. So a lot of companies can't even afford to buy some of the complex testers and we maybe hire them or rent them on a daily basis. So it saves money and it's also more efficient in most cases to try and move some of the testing onto your circuit. So. In this case, we may be not trying to solve everything. We just need to know in the first instance if the circuit is working or not. So we call this a go no go approach. So go means it's uh, circuits working, no go, which means there's a fault or the circuit is not working. So with today's uh, massive chips, we've seen you know, billions of transistors on a gate. Uh, it's impossible or nearly impossible, because it would take too long to input every possible input from outside the chip and look at every possible output from outside the chip. Because there could be hundreds, if not thousands of connections onto each chip. So rather than do it stage by stage or step by step, we try to have some way of compacting the data, that's compressing the data or reducing the data down in size for a simple fault diagnosis. And what we're looking for is a signature, a known signature of a device under test. So as we've all got our own signatures for signing our name, uh, a circuit will have its own digital signature when we apply a given set of test inputs. So looking at compressing the data, doing the testing on the chip, and trying to do it very fast and very cheaply. So we're making it efficient by doing what? So we've got to have a, a way of generating test patterns. You know, how long does it take? 
if it takes uh, one year to generate test patterns, it may be okay if you apply them to millions of chips, but if it takes one year for one chip, it's far too long. So that reflects really the size of the test patterns. You've got to make them big enough to test the majority of a chip, and then how long does it take to apply those test patterns? Again, if it takes a month to apply a set of test patterns, for most cases, it's going to be unrealistic. You want a very fast and efficient way of testing. So what we're going to do now is how to generate or develop a test procedure. So we've got to find a way or a method of generating the required test inputs in an efficient way. How do you look at the output responses? So we're going to apply test inputs to your circuit, which we call the circuit under test. You know the transfer function of your circuit under test. It could be an adder or a multiplier or a digital filter. So if we know what inputs are going in, know how your circuit should behave, we know what output should be coming out. So we can evaluate the output responses. If you get the correct response, you assume the circuit's working. If there's an incorrect response, you know it's a fault. I'm going to some way of implementing all this. So many years ago, I don't think you'd uh, generate test vectors on the fly. This means as they are required, you'd really generate them offline and apply them from some sort of uh, external tester. But now we can reverse this, generate the inputs as they are required, which is on the fly, sometimes an engineering term used. So how do we generate the inputs? If you use exhaustive testing, all input combinations applied. So if you had a chip with a thousand inputs or a hundred inputs even, you got to apply all the different combinations, not just as a truth table, but also in time. So this is pretty exhausting, never mind being exhaustive testing. Probably very difficult to do nowadays for large circuits. And you can do random testing. It has been shown, if you care to read the literature, that if you apply random inputs to circuits, it will very quickly find the faults. And with the whole theory on this, you can read about. So this is a good way of doing it. But both methods have shortcomings. As I just said, exhaustive testing will take too long and it's probably impossible for large circuits. And random testing, because it is random, doesn't allow you to know the input sequence because it's random. So that's then quite hard if you don't know the input sequence to know what the output sequence should be from a circuit under test. So, so far we've not got too far, but luckily you may have heard of it if you've done a degree course in electronics, you will have. We can generate pseudo random binary sequences. And we can generate them using a, a linear feedback shift register. And because the linear feedback shift register uh, has no gating, it has no outputs. So for every clock cycle, we know what the outputs are. We can generate a pattern that looks random to the circuit. But for every clock cycle, we know what that pattern is. So it's ideal to do testing. So a pseudo random binary sequence, PRBS, appears to the circuit as a random sequence. But its pseudo random sequence is known. And in a minute, I'm going to generate one so you can see what it looks like. So we generate the PRBS test pattern input. We apply it to a circuit under test, so we now know the transfer function, we know the input, so we can predict the output. And if we check the output against what we know to be correct, we can have a test uh, system, we can move on the chip. So there are different ways of generating uh, linear feedback shift registers, different feedback you can apply. And I've just done a four bit here, just so you can see the structure. So four bit, you have four D type uh, flip flops. You have feedback from two of the flip flops for a four bit. 
into a, a two-bit exclusive hall gate. And once you start this running, it will start to generate for every clock cycle a node output on QA, QB, QC, and QD, for example. So the only problem with uh, this setup is we're not allowed to have the all zeros state. So we have to initialize the shift register chain with at least a single one. So we have a preset on QD here. So we preset that to one. And we clear the output QC, QB, and QA all to zero. So when we start off the cycle, the initial outputs will be zero, 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 one. Once we have a single one in the system with the exclusive all gates, it'll propagate and generate the sequence. So as an exercise, I want you to have a look on your own, not now, but uh, maybe later today or tomorrow. Can you work out sequence output from a 4-bit linear feedback shift register? Oh, that's this one, so 4 bits in the shift register. Feedback, so was from the last one. And you can try feedback from the first one, the second one, and the third one in combination with the most significant output. So feedback from Q4 most significant and each of Q1, Q2, and Q3 in turn. So in my terminology now, this is feedback from Q1 here and Q4. And when you try it from Q4 and Q2, then again from Q4 and Q3, you'll see what the sequence is. So how long is the output sequence before it repeats? Because this type of uh, shift register with linear feedback will produce a sequence that repeats after so many cycles. So for PRVS, the output states is what we call maximal. So this is 2 to the power number of stages, which 2 to 4 gives us 16. Taking away one state, which is the all zero state we can't have. So the, the maximum or maximal sequence we can have is 15 states for a four stage uh, system. We moved it to eight stages, that would be 2 to the power 8. 256 minus 1, so it'll be 255 states. All zero is not allowed, I've just said it's a stall state. And we need to start with at least a single logic one in, or you could start with all logic ones if you wanted to. PRBS has a lot of complex properties. We haven't got time to cover it here. If you want to read about them, there's plenty of books on statistics or stuff online. You can check out properties of PRBS. So just to go over what the exclusive all function is, we normally show it's A exclusive or B with this uh, cross in a circle symbol. It's A not B or not A B. So basically, if the inputs A and B are the same, two noughts give a naught, two ones give a naught, you get a naught output. But if the inputs are different, A is naught and B is one, or A is 1 and B is 0, we get a 1. So you can see here, all the outputs would give us a change, apart from the two zeros give us a naught for the feedback circuit. So if the feedback's 0, 1, we get a 1 coming out. Feedback's 1, 0, we get a 1 coming out. When they both go to 1, which could happen, we get a 0 coming out. If a naught, two noughts going in, it just gets stalled at a naught. So if Q, A in this case, or Q, 1, and Q, D, or Q, 4, both at a naught. The naught comes out here, so very quickly after four cycles, oops, this fills up with noughts. So that's the state that's not allowed. So I just want to take you through this one. This is a four bit PLBS feedback from Q, A, and Q, D, which is the first. D type and the last. It's a maximal sequence, that means it's got 15 before it repeats. So just so we can go over how it works, we initialize in step one. So we set QA, QB, and QC to naught, and then we set QD to one in yellow here, which is the seed. And we do a, 
exclusive or function. QA exclusive or with D. One and naught is true, which gives a feedback of one. So if we go up to the circuit quickly, we'll see this uh, when one's coming out of there, the feedback of one goes into the first D. So this feedback of one here now goes into QA, the first D. And because it's this shift register, the original QA on the second cycle goes to naught. The QB on the first cycle goes to QC naught on the second cycle. And the QC goes to north. So the next cycle, step two, QD exclusive order of QA is at a one and a naught there. So it's true again. So the one goes in. And we keep going down. And you can see everything is stepping down as we go through each time things are shifted one step from left to right. And as we go through the sequence, you can see you can take the output from any of these. Q, A, Q, B, Q, C, Q, D. It's the same pseudo random sequence, but displaced by one bit between each cycle. So if we take Q, D, it starts at one, then it goes naught, 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 three noughts in a row, then four ones, one, 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 then naught, one, naught, one, one, naught, naught. Then it goes back to naught, 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 one as a four output. So after 15 steps, it repeats, and if we continue to clock, and just keep repeating every 15 steps forever. So if we read it out now, I've just read it out. QD is this uh, sequence. The uh, maximum length for A equal four is 15, as shown. Um, we can use this to generate uh, data inputs. Obviously, four bits is just an example. You can do any number of bits you want. And you need to choose the appropriate feedback to get the maximal sequence. So if you look at the sequence for QD, uh, the runs of ones and noughts is what form part of a PRBS sequence. So for this type of sequence, when n is four, the maximum number of ones in a run is four. See one, one, one here. The maximum number of noughts in a run is three. Then you got two ones together here, two zeros together, then single ones and noughts in the rest of the sequence. So when you get this to say 10 bits, you got 1,023 bits in the run. So it you know, really does look random to the eye as well as to the circuit. So once you've got the inputs, you now need to look at the output. So Exhaustive output is impractical for general testing. You can't compare every output to every expected output. It just take too long. So sometimes you may have two or more circuits. Sometimes you call one of them a golden circuit. You compare the output of the golden circuit with the circuit on the test, or you could just compare two similar circuits. But again, for complex circuits, this is uh, becoming inefficient nowadays. So it's better to reduce the output or compress or compact it and look at reduced form of the output, which is the signature. So way of compressing, you've got, I don't know, 100 bits, you might be compressing it down to 10 bits, for example. So you've got fewer output bits and input bits, so you're comparing less bits in the signature. And the signature hopefully will include all the relevant uh, bits of the test. You can have parallel and serial signature analysis. And how does it work? Well, it compares the input of a, another linear feedback shift register, which looks similar to the PRBS generator, but it has the output of a circuit under the test, the output response of a circuit under the test added into another exclusive OR function. So fault free circuit produces a known signature and the faulty circuit should produce a different signature, which is an error. But because we're compressing the data, sometimes it doesn't happen. And you can have some signatures which look to be fault free or a faulty circuit. If this is the case, you need to make the uh, signature larger. So how does it look? 
But similar to one before, we got the linear feedback sheet register. Four stages are shown. Say over the last one, we got feedback from Q4 and Q1 going into an exclusive OR gate to give us the uh, maximal sequence. And we added the test data one bit at a time into another exclusive OR gate gated with the feedback. So it's a serial analyzer, this one. So the test data is entered one bit at a time. If you've got multiple outputs, it's possible to multiplex them and enter them one bit at a time by a multiplexer. And the correct bit pattern at the input will give the correct signature. And as I said before, faulty circuits should give a different signature. However, sometimes aliasing can occur or a faulty circuit masquerades with the same signature as a good circuit. In that case, we need to put extra bits into the signature and this should give us a bigger distance between a good and a faulty signature. So of course, serial only takes one bit at a time, otherwise pretty good. We can go to parallel signature analysis, which will take one bit at a, one bit at a time to each gate in the shift register chain by adding an exclusive OR gate at each stage. So then we enter data in parallel, one bit per stage. Because it's a higher compression or higher compaction factor, you can get a higher aliasing rate. So I'll give an example here of a three bit analyzer just to show you how we add in the gates. So here are the flip flops, three flip flops. Here's the feedback. In this case, you got feedback from the last two flip flops to give us a maximal sequence. And you got three inputs A dash in, B dash in, C dash in. They're added in to an exclusive OR gate at each stage. And at this stage, it's added in with the. This is the feedback here, and these are the data flow through the system. So it's added in. Data input exclusive or with the output, and the output is read at the top here FF dash one out, FF two dash out, FF three dash out. So that's how you can do testing. And now, someone in about 1979 came up with an idea of coming up with a new type of register, which they called a built in logic block observer which again, you have an existing register. Uh, here's a register here, we've got a D-type, a clock coming in, a not Q output, and then another stage here. So one stage is shown. And then we have a number of steering gates on the Bilbo. And it's very clever design. Using a minimum number of gates, we have two control functions, B1 and B2. And B1 goes into the uh, OR gate here. And it can be ORed with external inputs, like Z1, if there's four stages up to Z4. This is an, into an exclusive OR gate, which goes into the D type. So you can see the structure now. If this exclusive OR gate can pass data through from a previous gate, which comes in through this NOR gate, we've now made a parallel signature analyzer. You should be able to see the structure of this NOR gate now. It's got a control function B2 going into here. And the outputs, uh, because any data going through in a horizontal fashion is effectively inverted by the NOR gate, we have to take the output from the NOT Q at each stage. Now, if you look, at, look this up in some uh, textbooks, we get this wrong. Take the output from the Q, which would give you the wrong output, which is inverted. So how does it work? Well, basically, the control functions B1 and B2 turn on and off the control gates, the OR gate there and the NOR gate, sorry, the AND gate here and the NOR gate. And then this exclusive OR uh, passes data through or not as required. The data can come through in parallel from the top. Z1 is the parallel extra input. So this is one stage. 
If you've got four stages, you'll have four stages like this. If you've got 10 stages, you'll have 10 stages like this and so on. And the serial data can come in here through this multiplexer. So the good thing about this design is we can have a serial register by adding data in through here. Got a control B1, which will turn into a serial register. And control B1 is in another way. It'll take data from the feedback, Q1 and Q4. So when you uh, turn it on this AND gate, obviously you need a 1 on B1 to turn this AND gate on to open it. We take data in in parallel from above. When you put a naught on B1, it closes off this AND gate. No data comes out. I'll have a naught on the exclusive OR. So it's quite an efficient design with a small number of gates and the table I've drawn up to show you the modes of operation. So when both B1 and B201, it's a parallel reading register, data is read in from the ZI. So that means this gate is open with a 1 and this gate is basically closed with a 1 on the control inputs. And both control inputs are naught. It's a serial reading shift register. A naught on B1 closes the AND gate. A naught on B2 effectively opens the NOR gate. So test data scanned in by serial I.O. or scanned out by serial output port. So it can be just used as a standard serial register. Now when we turn both the gates on, so one on B1 turns the top gate on, remember, and north on B2 turns the bottom gate on. So in this case, one is turned this gate on and north is turned this gate on. So data is read in from there, allowed to pass through the uh, exclusive OR gate. So now we've built a parallel signature analyzer. The data is flowing from the top direction on the horizontal direction. So it's a parallel signature analyzer. Or if we fix with our eyes, it can be a test generator. And the really clever one, when you make the inputs, control inputs, naught and one, if there's no clear on these D types, you make the input naught on here and this one on here, you get two noughts going into the exclusive OR gate because there's a naught out. And when you apply clock pulse, it resets the register to zero, which is a clever form of gating. So that's the billboard register. So how do you use it for testing? Well, you need two billboard registers. What you can do is you configure one uh, as the input generator. So that generates the input waveform. Then you apply that to a block of logic, combinational logic, and then the second billboard, which can be the parallel signature analyzer. So here you are. First billboard is a test vector generator, and the second is a parallel signature analyzer. And if you've got multiplexes in the circuit, you can reverse this uh, by changing the control B1 and B2 functions and look at different blocks of logic. And you've got normal operation, it can be a serial or parallel register. So very nice design. OK, so there's an exercise. If you want to try this, about a four bit serial signature analyzer. So the input sequence you're expecting is this one, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, with the most significant bit comes in first. When you put it into a four bit analyzer, after you've done the eight clock cycles, the signature comes out as one, zero, zero, one. This is what we call a good circuit with the good signature. However, if you apply these different signatures in turn, you should get a different signature in the last four bits from this circuit. So this time you apply 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. What is the signature you get? Should be different. But because we're compressing 8 down to 4, you find that some of these circuits will give you what looks like the correct signature, even though if you compare these sequences, they're all different from the correct sequence here. So if you run through this, you can see how faults can occur with signature analysis. So if you get a chance to do this, it's worth a go in the next day or two. 
So the final thing I want to do today is about boundary scan. <clears throat> Boundary scan came in when uh, a lot of manufacturers of, and users of integrated circuits, semiconductor companies, could see that it's going to be impossible to test uh, integrated circuits on printed circuit boards or substrates. So around about 1980 into 1990, they came up with an IEEE, which is the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, JTAG, which is Joint Test Action Group, had many meetings and came up with a new standard 1149.1 to help with basically electronic probing of circuit boards to, to test that the manufacturer is correct and uh, all the connections, interconnections on the board were okay. So when you go to service mount technology, SMT, means you've now got chips on both sides of a board and the chips can actually be touching. So if this is the case, there's no room for physically you know, probing the devices. And nowadays with uh, solder connections in the hundreds or even tens of microns, it's nearly impossible with a naked eye to probe them anyway. Maybe with some mechanical system you can. And with the ball grid arrays, the connections uh, underneath the chip, so physically you can't put a mechanical probe in anyway. So it's moved on a lot in the last uh, 30 years, but these people were ahead of the game. They could see things were shrinking, and it now is a way, allows a way of electronic probing of the internal of the external signal puffs. And the beauty is, bear in mind now chips have hundreds, if not thousands of input output connections you can do it through a simple four or five wire interface to the IC. So another four or five pins or connections. And the bonus was, uh, it originally was thought to be about external testing of solder connections between chips on board. It enables you to test the IC itself. In other words, it enables you to do the internal testing of the IC. So initially it was for digital circuits, but it's being extended uh, to do different types of um, circuits. And when it came in, we did say we're trying to start a boundary scan description language to tie in with other languages to help with the development of test routines. I actually got some of the first JTAG chips in the 1990s and we built a test circuit. And in those days, there was no support for software, so we had to program it all in the sort of binary code, which was pretty difficult, but we might to do it. So what's it do? Well, we have to add boundary scan, which is the short form word for JTAG, 1149.1, boundary scan to a chip. So what we're doing, we add in a boundary scan cell, which is an interface cell between each input output pin and the internal logic. And all the boundary scan cells are joined together to form a boundary scan chain. And the boundary scan chain goes on the periphery or boundary of a chip, hence the name boundary scan. And we can input data called TDI, test data input, into the chain. And every clock cycle, we can clock it around the chain to fill up this uh, boundary. And at the same time, we can clock out through test data output the output of this chain. So like in all test uh, circuits, we have to maintain normal operation. So normally, boundary scan cells will allow data from input output pins. There's an input pin into the logic, there's an output pin out through the boundary scan cell to the input output pins. One of the key things we'll see in a minute is the clever design of these boundary scan cells. So, to get it to work for testing, you've got an input pin, test data input, an output pin, test data output. You need two additional pins, a test clock, which clocks the state machine, finite state machine, which is the tap controller, which stands for test access point controller. 
and you've got test mode to light TMS, which is set up to a single one or naught to take the top controller, as we'll see again in a minute, through a test sequence. A couple of clever things in here. Uh, you've got an instruction register for doing different tests, as we'll see in a moment. And uh, you kind of have registered in here given the number of a chip, so you can check the right chips in the right place. And also a bypass register, which is another clever addition. If you've got a chip with a thousand connections to clock test data input around the chain, and out through test data, alpha will take a thousand clock pulses. And if that chip's not of interest to your immediate test, it's take a lot of time. So we'll put a bypass register in. So in one clock cycle, you can input the data, test data input through bypass to test data output, and onto the next chip. So for example, say you had 10 chips on a board, and you only wanted to load up the boundary consoles in one or two of the chips, it saves a lot of time in loading the data. So the standard actually got a copy of the standard. Uh, don't go to bed reading IEEE standards, but if you're a digital designer, it's quite elegant, the design of the uh, JTAG standard, and well worth having a look at. So what's the overview? Well, the scan path permits control and observation of the input output node directly using the boundaries consoles because they're placed between the circuit logic IO and the IC pin. So the probe now, the testing, is inside the chip, which is better in the old fashioned way where the probing was on the copper connection or the pin connection to a chip outside the chip. So boundary scan actually tests for solder joint connection and a connection inside the chip into the logic. So it's actually better than what it replaced. So normal data input and normal data output are still via the pins. So what is a test access point? I started to tell you it's a synchronous finite state machine that controls the test access point. You've got serial test mode select and the test clock. So you set up test mode select and you clock it through the various things. Sequencing of the state machine, if you want to comply with the standard, is specified in the standard. And I say it's quite neatly done. Some people might decide to do a their own variation, but I wouldn't recommend it. It's got a one bit bypass register, and you can load up an instruction register, as we'll see shortly. And all the component IO pins must be corrected, connected to the adjacent boundary consoles, which form the single boundary scan chain on the outside of the chip and is controlled by the state machine. So with a state diagram about how it works, which looks more complicated than it actually is, I hope you can read it. So what you would do first is you'd go into probably reset everything, test logic reset. So the ones and zeros are the inputs to the test mode select, and they move between the boxes on the clock, test clock. So we go from one test either we put a one on test mode select, we go into select the R scan. We don't want to do that yet, so we put one on test mode select, we go to select IR scan. IR scan is the instruction register. So we put test mode select naught, and capture IR when we enter in an instruction register or an instruction which might be an 8 bit serial string. Once we've done that, we come down to exit instruction register. Then we update the instruction register, and the instruction register might be to perform an external test. Now, from instruction register, we put an autumn test mode, so let me come back up to test room idle. We may want to load up the data which is a boundary scan. So again, we step down the chain with ones and nodes on the test mode select control, shift in the data. Could be 50 bits, 100 bits on the, depending on how big the boundary scan is. Once the data is ready, we can exit and update it. We can come up here and we can run the test. And then we can step the data out. So you can basically have these two operations. These things in the middle, uh, 
for the IO and exit. If something goes wrong, you have to step out. Basically, you load up an instruction, load up the data, then you run the test and load out the data results. So nowadays, there's a number of companies uh, supplying JTAG test equipment, and all of this will be fully automated in their software. So because I am a digital engineer, I'm very keen on uh, elegant design. And the boundary can sell, you can see it's been designed by the committee. I assume refined over some long discussions. But we've got down the boundary can sell design to two multiplexes and two D types. So basically, the normal data input is here. This might be an input pin, and the normal data output might go into your system logic. So basically, it's going through from the pin straight through this two to one multiplexer with a small increase delay, and obviously, which wasn't there before, into your logic. If you want to do a test, a serial input might come in here. You can go into this D type, and now the serial output will go to an X bonus scan cell. So this cell will sit on top of the next one. So the serial output will go out to the next one. If you've got 100 bonus scan cells, you apply 100 clock drive pulses. This is from the uh, tab controller to load up all these D types. So why are you doing this? Uh, nothing's connected into the normal data output, so you can do this in isolation and the circuit could remain working if you wanted it to be. Then when you want to do a test, having loaded up all these details with the test data, you do an update drive, but then outputs the data through this multiplexer, and you're doing the test. So a good thing about this balance console design is if this was an input pin and that's going into the logic, use the same design for an output pin. It's just for these two uh, data inputs are reversed. So normal data input would now be coming from the logic, and normal data output would go to the pin. So you can use this simple design for all the input or output pins. If it's a three state or multi input output pin, you need more than one boundary console. But that's straightforward. So standard instructions, according to the standard, if you want to meet the standards, it's mandatory or compulsory to do a bypass. So you go in and out in one sample, X test, which is external testing, and sample, which is sampling inputs coming in to the, to the chip using the bound cell. And because you've got this uh, control, if we go back here, now we've got control to isolate input and output pins from the logic. We can use the boundary scan chain to switch on any internal built-in self-test we've built already into the logic. And it can run that built-in self-test in isolation from the pins. Is there a part of that? If you run them into, run into this is something that will carry on. If you run internal self-test and it wasn't isolated from the pins, you could affect the logic outside and do damage. Okay, so we're nearly finished. So you can run built-in self-test, which is your own test, or sometimes manufacturers might have their own test. You can switch on, but we won't tell you exactly how it works, because we want to keep it confidential, so you can do both of those things. So quickly, to finish off the applications, X-Test is external testing, mainly for connecting PCB interconnect. So if you've got one IC driving, I see two and three, so I see one is driving, I see you can detect. So it starts driving there. Inside it goes to the pin, that pin soldered to the board. That board is connected along usually a copper wire. The other pins soldered to the joint and inside the chip. It's actually doing a test from within one chip to inside all the other chips. So it's more powerful than just sticking a probe on the wire. Because you, you then wouldn't know if a solar joint was being fully made anyway. Also, I can detect open circuits on PCB tracks, because obviously an open circuit will give you the signal won't pass through. So if you pass a one or an auto along, it won't get through. 
to an open circuit, an open solder joint, or a short circuit on the track can all be found out of a fault scan using boundary scan. If you've got a PCB type uh, edge connector, which is used less nowadays, but maybe in old fashioned equipment, if you've got a board plugged into a back plane, any open edge on the motherboard, boundary scan chain, if it's passing data through there, will find an open circuit. Okay, so to summarize on this design for test, test should be built in from the start. You shouldn't think about it you know, after you finish the design because it's too late. And if you can use design for test techniques, they should be used. Boundary scan, if you're designing chips, is essential to test modern surface mount technology PCBs and to test ICs. And diagnostic software, if you can develop it or utilize other people's, is really becoming important. And nowadays, most people are dealing in high level languages and different test languages. If you can take time to learn and use these languages, it will, in the long run, save you a lot of time. But the best thing about tests is you need to think about the problem. And if there's any manual about the system, how it should work, specifications, reading that first, the laws prove useful, either engineers and the public don't tend to like to do this. So that's the end of the slides. I don't know if people have got any questions you want to chat about anything for the next few minutes so we can continue on tomorrow. So I'll stop now and see if there's anything coming in from anybody. You about Samia? Yes, so. How, how do I get it back? Yeah, we there can have question and questions from the participants, sir. So. Okay, I've got. I can see Would the big box like anyway. To have one? <laughs> Hello. So. Participants. So participants, yes, go ahead. I'll go ahead. Okay, participants, it's an opportunity for all of you to interact with uh, Professor David Harvey. So, would you like to? Do you have any question? Feel free to ask. This is important, Professor Harvey, to have few questions so that some ice breaking takes place and they start interacting, and therefore I'm requesting them to do so. Yes, so, sir. participant. In any question, feel free to ask. It may be you need not to evaluate before asking question whether it is relevant, not relevant. Yes, Abhishek, uh, would you like to go ahead? Abhishek, no, I can see you have unmuted. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, sir. No, sir. Uh, everything is fine, sir. That's the sir has well explained the beast and all very nicely. Very nice. Thank you very much for your uh, good. <sighs> Acknowledgement that things are going good. So, any anyone uh, would like to ask any question? Please unmute and say something. Yes, Renu Gupta. Do am I? If I'm audible to you, would you like to ask any question, Dr. Renu Gupta? No, yep. sir. It was a nice interaction, sir. I have uh, gained some knowledge about nanotechnology since I was uh, having very few knowledge about nanotechnology. But uh, after uh, listening this uh, presentation, I have come to know about the nanotechnology and it's uh, how it can be done, implemented in various uh, fields. Thank you, sir. It was Thank a nice you, presentation, sir. Good. Thank you very much for your acknowledgement. Uh, we are really happy. You know, the purpose for which we are organizing this program is to make you happy, make you learn. OK, so if it is satisfied, maybe a few other people, if you do not have any question, maybe if you would like to suggest something, some improvement or acknowledge that things are going good. 
any anybody kalpana singh if i am audible to you would you like to share something we have uh, one of our faculty colleague also present here <coughs> dr yogendra prajapati ji uh, would you like to share something uh, thank you sir uh, everything sir fine sir thank you right. thank you very much sir. Yeah, I hope uh, Professor Harvey, you know him. Uh, he is one of our yes. colleagues in the electronics engineering department. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. I, went, I went for a walk with him in the early morning. <laughs> Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you, sir? I'm fine. Sir, uh, again, um, we are going to organize a one international conference in October, 2022. So again, uh, I would like to invite you to join this conference. Okay, be very okay. kind. <laughs> okay, because uh, also you are participating in the last year conference or uh, in previous all the four conferences at till now. Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yogen Kumar ji. uh any other participant would you like to share something uh is it going as per your expectation or some deviation you want some modification changes feel free to share uh i'm not getting any response sir. maybe tomorrow we'll have more and more questions uh that's fine i'm, I'm not going anywhere don't worry <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> so not only for 5 days you are going to be st no stay with us for lifetime okay so you you, you are already with us okay so we we feel very homely while interacting with you so thank you very much for giving this uh, liberty to us thank you oh, so well, part participant once yep sorry go ahead sir tomorrow morning i can you know be available all day so any questions no problem sure 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 should be fine okay so maybe we can conclude now uh, so i'm over to you uh, for can thank you so much sir thank you david have said it was uh, nice interacting you as well as it was a very friendly session as uh, we as i was not from the background but i literally enjoyed uh, interacting with you and uh, thank you so much sir and uh, uh, in uh, tomorrow we would be having the first session again joining at 2 pm and uh, we would be having the first session as cat design and uh, simulation examples it would be a lab as well as the tutorial class so i hope everybody has got with the schedule so we would be meeting again tomorrow everyone so yes. today we are sir, david, your time is uh, tomorrow 9:30 okay so indian time we are going yeah. to start at 3 o'clock by a uh, lecture by you prior to that we'll be having one lab session by one of our local faculty can, can i join can i join a lab session as well yeah can definitely be happy to your expert advice is definitely needed uh, well, just, so we'll just to listen just to listen to a lab session i'll just i won't, I won't take over sure. <laughs> sure sure so we'll be happy to have you there i'll, I'll join you at 8:30 it's okay yeah it's okay Yeah, 9:30. Cool. Your lecture is scheduled at 9:30. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you okay, very well. much, and thank, thank you for the Soumya. participation. Thank you. Thank you, Soumya. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you. Too long. Yeah. See you tomorrow. You and good afternoon to you. Yeah. Thank you. I can have some lunch now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. you. Good evening to everybody. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Sir. Yeah, good evening. Yeah. Very young. Yeah. Thank you everyone.